I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, everybody. Are there any proposed changes to the order of the agenda this evening? Nothing from staff this evening, Madam Mayor. Okay, and I don't see anything from council. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so we have several uh, presentations this evening. Uh, the first one is uh, a present, uh, presenting uh, com pro a proclamation com commemorating the 10th anniversary of the passing of Omar Ahmad. And we are joined this evening uh, by Omar's sister, Fatima Ahmad, and his mom, uh, Nadira Ahmad, is also on the line with us. And uh, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and read the proclamation, and then uh, we'll see if anybody else uh, would like to make comments. Commemorating the 10th anniversary of the passing of Omar Ahmad, whereas on May 10th, 2011, the people of San Carlos were saddened to learn of the sudden and untimely passing of our beloved mayor, Omar Ahmad. And whereas Omar Ahmad was not only well known as a technologist, entrepreneur, and advisors to many companies in Silicon Valley, but is remembered for his passion for democracy and commitment to public service. And whereas Omar Ahmad served as a member of the city's Economic Development Advisory Commission, before his election to the San Carlos City Council in November 2007, where he served as a city council member, vice mayor, and made history as one of the first Muslim mayors in the United States. And whereas during his tenure on the city council, a number of difficult choices had to be made, and despite tremendous opposition pr pressure, Omar Ahmad applied his political fortitude to champion efforts to eliminate a $3.5 million budget deficit ending 11 years of cuts and debt in the city. And whereas Omar Ahmad gave energetically and selflessly and touched the lives of people throughout the community who have greatly missed his leadership, friendship, zest for life and dedication to San Carlos. Now therefore be it proclaimed that I, Laura Palmer Lohan, mayor of the city of San Carlos on behalf of the city council and the San Carlos community pay tribute to Omar Ahmad on this 10th anniversary of his pa passing by commemorating his life and enduring legacy presented this 10th day of May, 2021. Thank you. All right. I see council member Collins would like to say a few words. I would uh, Madam Mayor and thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, I can't believe it's been 10 years since Omar's passing. Um, as you can see by that picture there, I had the honor and the privilege of introducing Omar to give our State of the City address uh, at the Hiller Air Museum on, uh, I think it was in uh, April, it was uh, in actually late March, uh, about four or five weeks before Omar passed. And I was president of the chamber at the time and I had no clue that uh, I would be um, in the position of running to replace him in the fall. And I can fairly say that had he lived, I probably wouldn't be sitting here tonight. Um, also in his honor, I, I'm wearing the same tie that uh, I was wearing uh, the, the night that I introduced him, but he was uh, such an amazing person. I would spend a lot, a lot of time, uh, I would see him over at the bank club and we would talk about what was going on in the city. And I was so impressed with him. And he had so many good ideas. He had the he had the temerity to uh, put forth uh, a lot of changes. He was one of the driving forces between uh, moving our police department to the sheriff's uh, office and also uh, moving our our uh, fire department uh, away from our partnership with Belmont and into the partnership with Redwood City. And and San Carlos really owes him a, a, a big debt of gratitude. Um, I also would be res remiss in, uh, if I didn't mention that uh, it was the first State of the City address held in the evening, and my wife said it was the best one that she ever attended. So anyway, um, my uh, it is good to see his family again tonight. I miss him all the time, and uh, I'm just grateful that he was in the right place at the right time to serve our great city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Collins. 
All right, I see that uh, among our attendees, we have Christine Boland would like to say a few remarks. Go ahead, Christine. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, and uh, Jeff Maltby, members of the public and the Ahmad family watching and listening. I'm Christine Boland, um, San Carlos resident and former city clerk and also former Parks and Recreation Director. I'm certain today is a tough day for many people. I actually broke down several times from the time the agenda was posted and over the weekend Recalling what a great individual Omar was, we worked very closely, and uh, he was such a funny guy. Uh, I loved working with him. He was the guy that called, said, hi, boss, before anybody was using the term boss. Um, I recall, I recall um, you know, the last trip down the elevator with him, I was, the, I was the last one to see him, and we said, see you tomorrow, and uh, you know, the morning of his, the morning of May 10th was tough. His service at the, the Muslim temple, the public memorial that Nakaya, Jeff and I worked so hard on in three days time. It was a beautiful memorial for Omar. I know many of his relatives tonight are watching and, and let me say, I feel for you. I know I feel for his mother, his sisters, all of his relatives are still posting on the, on Omar's Facebook memorial page. It, it still hurts 10 years later. And, and he was such a good mayor, such a great friend. Um, as Ron was saying, the city was headed towards a financial disaster. I don't think, you know, the vast public knew, but there was a lot of cities declaring bankruptcy. And I think we were in line at that point if something wasn't done. So he really had the courage um, to, to create the San Carlos Fire Department and, um, and uh, not lay off hundreds of essential workers. Um, literally, we saved millions overnight, putting the city right back on the financial track. And uh, to see him gone the next day was really tough. Um, you can say Omar really saved San Carlos. He really did save the city. He's sorely missed. 10 years later, and I have my box of Kleenex here just in case I need it. It's, uh, I think about him every, you know, all the time I think about this guy. We went to the Giants game just the Saturday before he passed away. And my entire family said, wow, that guy's the coolest mayor ever. He's... He will be missed for his courage of his votes, his time on the council, his fun and unique personality. And I really don't recall anyone in the 18 years I worked for the city, I don't recall anyone, uh, the council honored anyone 10 years later. Um, so this is a very special guy. Um, and God bless Fatima and Adira. I know that um, your father passed away last year. It was really, really tough to read that, but he was so proud of Omar. And now as Omar would say, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Christine. you, Christine. Um, and we have a former council, a former mayor and councilman, um, Brad Lewis. Um, Hello there. Uh, I'm sorry, there's just a bee there. I thought there might be, I, I'd have a stunning picture uh, like Ron had there to share about Omar tonight. Um, I just wanted to uh, participate and, and let everybody know, certainly Omar's family and for everybody on the council, that it was a certainly a transitional sort of decade uh, serving alongside. Omar was one of the great, great joys uh, for me. You know, there's a, you sort of envision yourself when you get on council having a fraternal relationship with the other council members and um, Omar sort of represented that uh, to, to the highest degree. It really became sort of a, um, a really nice sort of uh, fraternity of sorts that, that uh, we had. We spent time outside of council meetings. Um, and, you know, part of what I wanted to sort of say tonight is how 
sort of policy and personality are not always intertwined, but with Omar, he always had an effervescent personality, a smile. Um, he was a pragmatist. Um, he would listen to arguments. He always had really like a high intellect, well thought out point of view on things. And I learned a ton from Omar while we worked together. Uh, we, and again, as I said, we spent time outside of council together. Um, and and uh, he was such a, a lovable person. And and it's, it's really a rare um, connection that you have with a fellow com uh, council member like I did with Omar. And I wanted to say the family should be in, in just extraordinarily proud of everything that uh, that Omar achieved. Um, absolutely an everlasting memory uh, on all of us that uh, interacted with him. And, uh, you know, it, 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 I often think about, you know, when, when he was first um, uh, campaigning for council, it's like, who's this guy in the Segway that's going all over town and waving, <laughs> waving to little kids, and he's going up and down, you know, Eucalyptus Avenue on Halloween. And, and uh, you know, he was as quick with a, um, a witty remark, um, uh, but also was always very personal and, and uh, connected. And, you know, I thank Omar for his friendship. Um, I, I thank um, uh, his family for the, for, the, for the gift that they gave to us, gave to the city of San Carlos. And um, I, I, I want to say it was, it was my honor to serve along with him. And uh, thank you very much for allowing me an opportunity to say something in his honor tonight. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. We have uh, Brian Mora. Sorry about not unmuting. <laughs> um, thank you, Mayor, members of Council, uh, City Manager Maltby, and uh, City Attorney Rubens. Um, I work with Omar, as did Brad and Christine, and I must say it was a memorable time. I worked with him initially on the uh, EDAC, the Economic Development Advisory Committee, when I was helping to staff that. Um, he bounded into my office one day, uh, years later, announcing he was planning to run for council, and he said, how do I do that? And I said, well, Omar, you're going to have to walk and you're going to have to knock on doors. San Carlos is a small town. And even though it was June, months before one would normally campaign, Omar said, I'm ready. And he pointed to the floor and I looked and there were his famous alligator skin boots. And as Brad said, away he went. Um, it was amazing to me that even though outside of the EDAC, most people in town did not yet know of Omar, but he knocked on so many doors and he made so many connections and got so many people smiling that as November approached, more and more people kept saying to me, you know, I think I'm going to vote for that Omar guy. And sure enough, he was elected to the council. Uh, another moment I remember about Omar was uh, we uh, had a bus ride to uh, Sacramento to meet with two state legislators at the time, Jackie Spear and Joe Simidian, to talk about trying to convince them not to take more money away from the city. And um, during that trip, Omar was multitasking, as he often did. He was on his smartphone tweeting. And when one of the council members from another city asked him what he was doing, and he said he was tweeting, the whole bus erupted in laughter, at which point Omar turned to them and said, you're all going to need to know this if you expect to get reelected. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give any elected official who wants a free course on how to tweet this Saturday. Come to San Carlos City Hall. It's free. A lot of people did, believe it or not, and indeed Omar almost immediately from joining the council had connections in every city in the whole county, which was invaluable to San Carlos at the time. Um, another thing that was an interesting uh, phenomena to me is, you know, everybody knows that Omar not only was known for his work at the city and as the mayor, but also in the tech field. You know, he was involved with the Discovery Channel, Netscape, Napster, and many more. Uh, one time he was coming back from lunch to City Hall and I saw him with a software developer, a young woman from Israel. And he introduced me and he said, why don't you give Brian the, the pitch you just gave me? And she described this amazing piece of software that would run on one smartphone, would keep track of traffic and of the best route to your home. And when she finished, she said, we're thinking of calling it Waze and Omar is helping us launch it. And I always think about that saying it's 10 years later, but Omar is still with me in the car every time I <laughs> drive. 
And, and I guess the final thing about Omar that I always marveled at is no matter where I was, whether I was in San Carlos, Silicon Valley, on the East Coast, even one time in London, when I told people I was working in San Carlos, they, they almost inevitably said, you must know Omar. And they never used his last name, which always I thought was amazing. I just thought, you know, when you talk about Omar, everybody knows who you're talking about. And that's true nationally and internationally. So I, I have to say in conclusion, Omar was such a fun, smart, collaborative person. He was a true friend. You know, he's somebody I will always remember and treasure. And uh, I think it's so great that you're honoring him tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. We have a uh, former mayor and council member, Andy Klein. Thank you, uh, Mayor Palmer Lohan and city council members. And thank you to the uh, family of Mayor Ahmad for allowing us the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I kind of want to echo Brad's thoughts about how much fun it was serving with Omar. I got uh, elected in his second half of his first term uh, on the city council and served the remainder of my time with Omar. And it was, you know, it was a rough year and a half for the city. We had uh, decided um, between Omar, Randy, and I, we were just not going to let the budget crisis continue and we were going to find a way to fix it. And we embarked on the joining of the sheriff's department and the breaking up of the Belmont St. Carlos Fire Department and eventually the creation of the St. Carlos Fire Department. Um, and it's surprising because it's how rough of a year and a half that was and how much grief we took and how much abuse we took from the public over these really monumental decisions that have led to real progress in the city. It was still fun. Um, and I think that's the big thing about Omar was, you know, it got, it got really bad there for a while where we would have council meetings with 300 firefighters or police officers and everyone was telling us, you know, where to go essentially. Um, but Omar always kept it light. He always wanted to hang out, wanted to talk, wanted to have a good time, always laughed. And, you know, no matter how bad it got, he always had a smile on his face. And I think that just says a lot about him as a person. He never lost track of what we were doing it all for. After a lot of long council meetings, we would go to Clooney's um, afterwards, me and some of the city staff and, and Omar and occasionally Randy. Omar didn't drink, but he would go just for the conversation. And unfortunately, that that final night, um, we were all just so exhausted. We took that final vote on the fire department, and you could see the exhaustion in just all of us, and we didn't go out. I kind of wish we had now, of course, but um, it's just amazing that his last meeting as mayor, uh, he created the St. Carlos Fire Department, and that has led to 10 years of uh, prospering for the city. So, you know, his legacy is alive and well. I think there are so many people who still think about him to this day. But the one thing I remember being the, the kid on the council and looking up to him as like a big brother, it was just so much fun to serve with him. He was such a good man. And I just, you know, when I think about him, I laugh a lot. Just all the inappropriate times he would shout, go Gators, um, riding the Segway in the middle of the sidewalk. Uh, it just, he just did a lot of fun stuff. And he was a great mayor. His service for the community is you know, it's just beyond belief for most council members to even come close to what to what he's done or what he did. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity to talk. And I, I miss my friend, but I know that as a city, St. Carl's is so much better for having had him serve. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And we have city manager uh, Jeff Mulpey would like to say a few words. Thank you. I too can't believe it's been 10 years Omar was, uh, was nine years older than I was when he passed away. And so he has, uh, he's always been very much on my mind, but uh, the last couple of years as I've had birthdays, he's definitely been uh, right at the forefront of my thoughts. I would echo the comments of, uh, of everything each and every speaker said. Um, he was a wonderful individual to work with. He had, he's had a profound effect on uh, myself and my life and my career and the lives and careers of many of the employees who uh, who worked with Omar while he was with the city. Um, some have gone on in their career and, and carried uh, his lessons and philosophies on to other places. Um, he would have been uh, a really amazing resource to have the last uh, four or five years and his take and views on 
the world and politics. He had a way of, uh, of always really listening, but, but keeping things light. Um, he could, he could always remind you what was, what was really important in any issue. And we dealt with some of the most difficult issues I've dealt with in my career while he was part of our city council. Um, one saying of his, and he, he had so many, and, and we've heard so many of them tonight that, that I actually repeat quite frequently uh, because I think it's so important for us uh, in local government and government in general to remember is his saying, uh, I love sacred cows. They're crispy and they taste delicious. Uh, and it reminds us to challenge the status quo and to not not be afraid of change and uh, to have the courage. And Omar brought so much courage and, and love and compassion to his role as a council member and mayor of our city. Um, the morning he passed away and getting the telephone call from our police chief and our fire chief about what was happening. Uh, and then later that morning um, with council member Royce uh, calling his family to tell them the news uh, will will always be one of the most profound moments of my life. Uh, in meeting his family and, and his friends and getting to know him even better uh, than we had known him before through his family and his friends and his stories. Uh, it was a real honor to know him. And uh, he's definitely one of those people that uh, that I will carry with me all the rest of my days. And his name comes up so frequently still in City Hall. Uh, and I think it always will as, uh, as long as there's still folks there that had the pleasure and joy of knowing him. So thank you. And uh, we still mourn his loss. Thank you, Jeff. All right, I'm uh, not seeing any other hand, hands raised at this time. Um, uh, through, through the chair? Uh, I, yes. If I may, I wanted to share a message that I received from uh -huh. uh, former mayor and council member Bob Grisilli. Uh He sends his regrets for not being able to join the meeting tonight, but asks that I uh, relay the following message to Omar's family. Omar was one of the brightest council members that I ever served with. He was dedicated to the city of San Carlos and always did his best to find a solution to any issue that arose, a solution that would be most beneficial to his fellow citizens. He was a leader and I, along with many others, miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. All right, uh, Fatima and Nadira, do you wish to make any comment this evening? Um, this is Fatima. I just, just want to say that um, Omar loved all of you and loved the city so much. And it means a lot to all of us that, that he lives on with so many of you and in your hearts. So thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you everybody. That was uh, very beautiful and um, heartfelt and he's dearly missed. And my regret is uh, not having had the opportunity to, to know him, but I feel as if I have gotten to know him uh, through uh, your love and uh, beautiful uh, remembrances. So thank you. Okay, so um, we'll move to the next um, uh, presentation. Uh, we have, uh, we'll be recognizing Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month this evening. And uh, with us this evening uh, to receive uh, the proclamation is, uh, are the following, Aparna Ramakrishnan, who is the Secretary for the Community Foundation of San Carlos, Rosie Jimenez, a member of San Carlos Kiwanis Club, Thalian Wang, Artistic and Executive Director of Zyro Dance, and Chris Tran, member of various racial justice committees in San Carlos. Designating May 2021 as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. 
Whereas Asian American and Pacific Islanders have a long and rich heritage of shaping the history of the United States and are instrumental in the future success of our nation. And whereas the month of May was designated as Asian American and Pacific, Pacific Islander AAPI Heritage Month to commemorate the immigration of the first Japanese to the United States on May 7, 1843, and to mark the anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10, 1869. The majority of the workers who laid the tracks were Chinese immigrants. And whereas celebrating AAPI Heritage Month raises awareness of the vital contributions of the AAPI community and honors the many AAPI leaders who have contributed to the progress of our nation, and whereas celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month is especially significant this year with the rise of anti-Asian sentiment throughout the country. And whereas one of the city of San Carlos's core values is to be safe, diverse, welcoming, and engaged community. We thereby condemn acts of hate, violence, and aggression toward any and all persons and stand in solidarity with the AAPI community. And whereas the city of San Carlos is strengthened by the diversity of ethnic, cultural, racial, gender, and sexual identities of its residents, all of which contribute to the vibrant character of our city of good living. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Laura Palmer Lohan, mayor of the city of San Carlos, on behalf of the entire city council, hereby declare the month of May 2021 as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and urge our community to join together to learn more about the AAPI heritage and celebrate their contributions to our country. Presented this 10th day of May, 2021. Thank you so much. Are there any of our guests who wish to make a few remarks this evening? Yes, hello, my name is Aparna Ramakrishnan. And on behalf of the Community Foundation of San Carlos, we thank you for recognizing the history and contributions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in our city, county, and country. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders from many different countries call San Carlos home. We represent a vast diversity of language, culture, religion, and history. And we've had varying paths that led us here, from choosing to emigrate to pursue our dreams, to fleeing unsafe situations beyond our control. As we celebrate the many accomplishments of AAPIs, it's also important to acknowledge the courage it took to move to a new place, which wasn't always welcoming, the hard work to succeed and the resilience to overcome many challenges. Joining the Community Foundation today and accepting this important proclamation are two notable Asian American members of our community who will share with you how they are working to make San Carlos a better place. Thank you, Parna. Who, who would like to go next? Uh, hello. Hello, my name is Rosie Jimenez. In 1976, my husband and I came to California from the Philippines to find better opportunities for our growing family and to be able to support our relatives back home. In 1989, we moved from Daly City to San Carlos to enjoy the sunny skies and safe neighborhoods. After a 24-year career at Hewlett Packard, I retired in 2005 to have more time to give back to my community and shape future generations, a long-held dream of mine. I am now one of the board of directors in the Kiwanis Club of San Carlos, leading service leadership programs at Calmon and Notre Dame that have grown since 2007 from just less than 20 member students to over 100 students per year, the biggest club at Calmon High School today. We have established a win-win partnerships and collaborating with San Carlos Parks and Rec Department to, divide, to provide volunteer resources to the city's annual community events. And in return, we enjoy the free use of the city space for our youth leadership training events almost 10 years ago. I look forward to making these Kiwanis activities sustainable and the youth key clubs self-sufficient. So these important initiatives continue to grow youth leadership that values kindness, support, and care for their communities as a way of life. Thank you, Rosie. Hello, my name is Felaine Wong. I lead Zuru Dance 
a nonprofit dance company promoting cross-cultural collaborations in San Carlos and other Bay Area communities. Zuru Dance presents innovative programs created by BIPOC artists to share stories, culture, and present pathways forward in difficult situations. In May 2020, Zuru Dance launched Project Dance Off in direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the Asian American xenophobia that came along with it. To those mentally affected by the impacts of COVID-19 and to those suffering from systemic racism and Asian American xenophobia. As an Asian American, I know what it's like to feel uncomfortable in this country. Zero Dance strives to be a safe space for people to belong, especially for those who lack environments to cultivate creativity and expression. Thank you, Colleen. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Chris Tran, and I am here on behalf of the Community Foundation of San Carlos Racial Justice Committee. I joined the foundation last summer to be part of the collective and because of the foundation's commitment in advancing racial justice for all, with zero tolerance for discrimination against any group, whether it be race, gender, ethnicity, religion, or any other intersectionality. We also wanna honor AAPI Heritage Month and stand in solidarity with Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, especially during these difficult times of continued anti-AAPI hate. We strive to be a source of positive change by listening to the community, making connections and providing resources to learn. We also provide a safe space for our community to come together, to share our stories, to amplify each of our voices and to be seen. Please join us in listening, in learning and being in community with one another. We invite you to visit our website for resources and events happening throughout the entire month of May to celebrate AAPI Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, and I see a few of our uh, council members and uh, Vice Mayor would like to speak. We'll start with uh, Council Member Rack, go to Vice Mayor McDowell, and then Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thanks for putting forth this proclamation. I just wanna, um, wanna congratulate everyone for participating and uh, thank you for uh, recognizing AAPI month and to thank Rosie and Feline and Aparna and Chris for all the great work they do in our community as they represent so many Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in, in our community in the greater San Carlos and, and the peninsula um, in contributing so much to our community and to our society. And uh, I'm pleased that we're commemorating this month and look forward to learning more myself and getting more engaged and thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I too wanted to thank um, the speakers this evening. And um, I just wanted to build on um, the fact that the Community Foundation has so many wonderful resources on their webpage right now. Um, there's a list of um, AAPI businesses, a directory, if you'd like to reach out and support local businesses in our community. There's a list of um, racial justice focused nonprofits to support. And then there's also just some really touching and moving stories about um, what brings joy to members of the AAPI community in San Carlos. And I had the opportunity to read through them today and they were just very moving. And I wanted to thank everyone for, for sharing their experiences in that forum. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor McDowell. Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And yeah, I just wanted to uh, say, I'm glad as a city we were able to pause and, uh, and recognize uh, this heritage month and i appreciate uh our guests this evening who uh, uh and what they had to share and uh it's just um uh good that we've uh, made time for this uh, thank you thank you council member dugan council member collins thank you madam mayor i just want to add my uh my thoughts to all the other uh points made by uh, my fellow council members uh, i want to thank everybody for coming tonight it's it's important that we recognize organizations such as this because they contribute so much to our culture and the richness of our diversity in this area. Um, and uh, we need, we really need to support each other in these days of, of such division in our, in our country. And I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm proud that we are recognizing this group tonight. And uh, I hope that we continue to uh, come together as uh, as a people. We are all uh, one nation and we, should never forget that. 
Thank you, Council Member Collins. And I also want to thank uh, our special guests this evening for your incredible contributions to our community and all, all that you put into uh, making sure that we have unity, uh, very powerful. And I uh, look forward to working with you in allyship and solidarity to continue the work uh, because it's so important to me that everybody who lives in this community feels as if that, that they belong because they absolutely do. So thank you so much. All right, so we'll move on to the next uh, presentation uh, in recognition of Public Works Week. And uh, receiving this proclamation is Stephen Machida, Public Works Director. Recognizing May 16th to 22nd, 2021 is National Public Works Week, Stronger Together. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life, and well being of the city of San Carlos. And whereas these infrastructure, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our community. And whereas San Carlos Public Works professionals are unsung heroes because they do their job so well that they are generally unrecognized by the public at large. And whereas it is in the public interest for our civic leaders and community to gain knowledge of and to maintain a progressive interest and in understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs. And whereas the year 2021 marks the 61st annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association to recognize the dedicated employees who safeguard our public infrastructure. Now, therefore, it be proclaimed that I, Laura Palmer Lohan, Mayor of the City of San Carlos, on behalf of the entire City Council, hereby proclaim the week of May 16th to 22nd, 2021, as National Public Works Week in the City of San Carlos and urge our community to pay tribute to our public works professionals and to recognize the substantial contributions they make to protecting our health, safety, and quality of life in the, San, in the city of good living, San Carlos, presented this 10th day of May, 2021. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Stephen Mimichita, uh, Public Works Director. On behalf of all our public works staff, I would like to thank you as well as the council members of uh, proclaiming May 16th to the 22nd 2021 as Public Works Week. Certainly, um, you know, my staff is very proud of the, all the work they do, and certainly they love working here in the city of San Carlos. So thank you again. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Council Member Collins, followed by Council Member Rack and Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I know we have a big agenda tonight, but I, I couldn't let the opportunity to uh, go by without congratulating our Public Works uh, Department. We've had some high profile projects recently that have turned out exceptionally well. Laurel and Cedar, uh, Arroyo and Cedar, um, the uh, uh, San Carlos Pedestrian and Safety Improvement Project, and several others that have been um, finished recently and are, some are still all ongoing. But our staff is just incredibly professional. They've done such a good job. and. Uh, I just want to extend my thanks to all of them uh, and for making us look good. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rack. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and I too just want to offer my congratulations to Stephen and, and his whole team. Uh, they really, we really are fortunate to have such a fantastic public works team in San Carlos. And um, I mean, just the extra work they've done around the downtown and just the many projects that Ron mentioned. Um, it's really, we're, we're fortunate and I, congratulations and, um, Keep up the good work. Thank you, Council Member Rack, Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I too wanted to express my very deep gratitude to Stephen and his team. Um, I don't think that you hear thank you enough. You hear complaints and um, you know areas for improvement. And I, I just hope that you know how deeply appreciative the community is of all of your efforts, especially in this last pandemic year when you and your team stepped up in just a major, major way with the water walls downtown and um, figuring all of that out so quickly at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, just very grateful that um, you and your team seem to always go above and beyond. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Vice Mayor McDowell. Council Member Dugan. 
Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, yeah, just uh, uh, public works falls pretty solidly in that category of uh, thankless job, I think, for the most part. So um, you hear a lot of the problems, you don't hear a lot of the appreciation. And so I think it's great we can pause here uh, for a week and, and appreciate all that uh, you and your team do, uh, Stephen. Uh, it's a lot of uh, good work in the community. It is appreciated. And, uh, and we do see that. And I think the, uh, the proclamation even said it all, uh, unsung heroes. And it's uh, important that uh, we recognize the good work that you do. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dugan. And I also just wanna add my uh, thanks and echo the sentiments of my colleagues this evening. Uh, there's not a repaired sidewalk or a street that I cross or new striping uh, that I that I use to get from one end to the other of the of the um, intersection that I don't think of you and your team, Stephen, and am deeply appreciative of all that you do to keep us safe and healthy. So thank you so much. All right. So we'll now move on to our next item, which is uh, item five A. Council members reports uh, on subcommittees, regional boards, commissions, and committees. Uh, these are brief items from members of the city council regarding upcoming events in the community and correspondence that they have received. They are informational in nature and no action will be taken on these items at this meeting. And I see we have council member Rack followed by council member Dugan who wished to make some remarks. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And actually they don't have any reports on things. I just wanna, I know we had Mother's Day yesterday. I just wanna wish a happy Mother's Day to all the to both you and the vice mayor. Hope you had a wonderful day and were treated well. And to all the members of the city staff um, that uh, you had a wonderful Mother's Day and to our community. Uh, so happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there in St. Carlos and beyond. Thank you, council member Rack. I have enough chocolate to get me through to the next holiday. So we're, we're, we're in good shape. All right, council member Dugan. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge a uh, rather constant stream of uh, communication and, and other contacts from folks in the community, just expressing uh, the very strong support for uh, keeping uh, Laurel Street closed and uh, our pedestrian mall going down there. So I just wanted to uh, recognize and acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, I just wanted to share that um, a couple of items. Uh, first is Peninsula Clean Energy issued a report to the city of San Carlos. Uh, in the past year, uh, San Carlos have uh, received an estimated $846,000 in savings through the Peninsula Clean Energy Program. 97% of, uh, of our residents are Peninsula Clean Energy uh, customers. Uh, that work has led to um, an estimated 37 1,523 um, metric tons of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions in the past year. So just wanted to acknowledge uh, the, the, the good works and the participation of everybody in the community on that. Um, and then also to just let everybody know that next Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, there's an event in San Mateo uh, Central Park uh, called uh, uh, Community United, uh, which is a gathering um, of what will hope to be representatives from every uh, city in the county, uh, recognizing um, many of the marginalized communities uh, throughout San Mateo County. So everybody is uh, welcome uh, to attend that. All right, so I'm not seeing any additional hands. So we'll move on to um, item six, which is public comment. Persons wishing to address the city council on matters not on the posted agenda may do so. Each speaker is li limited to two minutes. If there are more than five individuals wishing to speak during public comment, um, I'll skip over that part. If the item you are speaking on is not listed on the agenda, please be advised that the city council may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed by under the Brown Act. The city council's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on a future city council agenda for a more comprehensive action or report and formal public discussion and input at that time. Crystal, are there any members of the public who wish to speak? Yes, we do have one hand up at this time. Jaron Brady, you should be able to unmute. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jaron. I'm a student and essential worker and my family has lived here for three generations. I wanna start off by thanking Mayor Parma Lohan and Councilman Adam Rack for their effort these past months in pursuing hazard pay for the hundreds of essential workers employed in our city's grocery stores and pharmacies who have worked grueling and dreadful hours throughout the pandemic to provide the most necessary services for our community. I wanna preface this with my experience. Back in March of 2020, 
I witnessed the immense fear amongst my coworkers as they debated whether they should continue working to provide for themselves and their families or quit due to the high risk of contracting COVID-19 and spreading it to their vulnerable family members. As we now know, customer facing employees are five times more likely to test positive. And so far, more than 20% of grocery store workers have contracted COVID-19. I would like to remind this council that unemployment benefits were not available to those who quit their jobs despite having themselves and their loved ones lives at risk. Our city's essential workers continued to work $14 an hour, even though they did not sign up to put their lives at risk. Management in many stores failed early on to provide protection for their workers and when they did receive them a month into the pandemic. Our city's essential workers were forced to reuse single use masks for days at a time. I have friends and coworkers who are elderly, diabetics, have immune disorders, and have a variety of conditions which put them in devastating predicaments where they had to decide between living and being able to afford a place to live. While grocery stores and pharmacies posted record profits, the heroes on the front line who made it all possible received meager rewards. Our city's essential workers gave this reeling community a solid foundation to stand upon. And by not pursuing hazard pay, you are continuing to ignore them. This measure would provide the necessary compensation and recognition for their sacrifice of putting their lives at great risk. It is not too late to do the right thing. And I'm calling on this council to follow the lead of other cities who have passed this measure to provide the necessary support for our workers and residents. Thank you. Thank you, Jaren. Thank you, Jaren. Uh, and there are no other hands. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Uh, at this point, we'll uh, move to consent calendar. Uh, is there anybody on council who wishes to pull an item from consent? Uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to pull 7E and 7F. Okay. All right, do we have a motion on the other items? Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, okay. I will move to approve the consent calendar items A through D and G through K. I'll second that. Thank you. Crystal, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Councilmember Rack? Yes. Vice Mayor McDowell? Yes. And Mayor Parma Lohan? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Rack, are the items such that um, they're short enough that we can take at this time, or do we want to move them to later in the agenda? Um, I, I think they should be short enough, and I'm happy to talk about, since they're very similar, both of them in, in, in one segment, so I hope I can do this in just a couple minutes. Um, and I think I had mentioned to Jeff and Stephen, so they may have some additional information out there. I guess I just felt like um, I didn't have enough information in the in the packet around you know this sort of public works con uh, contracts in terms of the cost around what the competitive bid process was and the rating system to understand how we were sort of making this decision on picking one of the, uh, one vendor over another in this. And so I was hoping to get some more clarity around that before voting on it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yes, I'll be happy to. I'm Stephen Machida, Public Works Director, um, Councilman Rack. So um, just to be clear, um, both these both these contracts were actually um, uh, publicly bid um, and um, it were, they were actually advertised uh, for, um, you know, appropriate contractors uh, to, to bid on them. Uh, we bid, you know, approximately a two, two, uh, two month period and um, but we just received the two, these two um, contractors submitting their bids for, for both projects. So obviously the one is Northern Landscaping and the other is Terracare. Um, these, these two contractors are actually in, the incumbents um, for, for each of the projects where uh, Northern actually uh, is working on the meetings and open space uh, air, uh, portions of the contract and Terracare actually works for the parks uh, landscaping uh, and develop parks. So when we actually did the, the bid opening, we just looked at these two bids uh, for, from these two contracts. So um, as, as you kind of read in the staff report, um, there, were, there were three components to bid. There was the base bid. So for instance, if we take meetings, there's a base bid. Then we had a grade separation component as well as the big uh, Canyon Eden Park component. Um, and then uh, we used the 20% contingency and so, um, as I mentioned earlier, Northern um, Landscaping it was the incumbent of this contract. And so they actually came in under, um, or they, they were the lowest responsible bidder. Um, actually, Terracare in this instance um, 
they they submitted a bid. However, there were some inconsistencies inconsistency with their bid, and so that's we we had to throw this out. But our estimated cost for this work uh, of of the project was about two hundred thousand dollars, and Northern uh, Landscaping came in with their bid at two twenty seven two forty six. Uh, subsequently, the parks landscaping portion of it, again, um, TerraCare was actually the uh, incumbent, um, but that was based on the parks landscaping, the infield maintenance, and the Highlands Park synthetic turf maintenance. Um, the northern um, landscaping subtotal bid came in at um, 468.393, and the TerraCare came just a little bit under at 466.586. With a 20% contingency, it would bump up the uh, grand total to 559,903. Um, our estimated cost for just the sub, uh, excuse me, the, the contract without the contingency was about 550, uh, 550,000. And as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the, the bid for that TerraCare submitted was at 466,586. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Just so, I'm sorry, yeah, I think, so Stephen, the, the Northern, the TerraCare was the lowest responsible bidder over Northern by a couple thousand dollars. Is that what I understood or did I misunderstand? That's, that's approximately, yes. It's just a little under $2,000. Okay. And I guess I'm just wondering, do we ever get sort of like you might in the private sector, some sort of synergies around having just one vendor for all these things? It seems like we're within two thousand dollars. Like, we could I understand the public work contracts work differently, but could we have bundled this as one larger contract and try to go out to bid on that and potentially have cost savings around that instead of going, breaking this up in two? Well, I mean, certainly there, anything's possible. However, the reason why we tend to bundle them separately is they have a little bit different components. Like, for instance, on the um, you know the infield maintenance, it, it uses different type of equipment. Um, especially if you have um, uh, work that involves working on the medians or on the grade separation, there's a little bit different type of uh, equipment. And, and there needs to be a, some knowledge of uh, traffic control or information of traffic control, you know, because you are working in, in medians where vehicles are traveling. Whereas part fields uh, and open space areas, you know, that, that's not required. So we, we try to separate the work uh, on the type of equipment that might be needed Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I had no further questions. Okay. All right. So I'll entertain a motion on those two items. I'll move to approve city council consent calendar items E and F. Second. Okay. Crystal, can you please take the roll? Vice Mayor McDowell? Yes. Council Member Collins? Yes. Council Member Dugan? Yes. Council Member Rack? Yes. And Mayor Parma Lohan? Yes. All right. Uh, so we'll move on to the next item, which is reports to council. We'll receive an update on the coronavirus uh, COVID 19. Uh, these are updates on key city projects by city department heads and staff and city council subcommittees. They are informational in nature, and no action will be taken on these items at this meeting. And tonight uh, presenting, I understand, is Jeff Maltby, city manager. Jeff? Thank you. I, I think you're going to have to uh, forward the slides for me, Crystal. This will be a very short presentation tonight. Uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 testing, the uh, San Carlos testing site at Central Middle School remains open Tuesdays through Fridays. Uh, all ages in both residents and non-residents are welcome. Uh, testing does remain uh, an important com component to our community's uh, fight against uh, the spread of COVID and our, uh, our progress towards uh, reopening uh, all aspects of, of our uh, community. Uh, there are appointments available through the uh, curative website, uh, uh, cur.tv backslash San Carlos, or you can call 888-702-9042. Next slide. Uh, COVID-19 vac vaccinations. Uh, I know many of us have uh, have had the opportunity to to, uh, to be vaccinated or, or are in the process 
of uh, receiving uh, either one or one of the two necessary uh, shots to be vaccinated. Uh, there are, in San Mateo County, uh, there are uh, twice weekly clinics at the San Mateo County Event Center. They're open to everyone who live or work in San Mateo County. Uh, appointments for the event center can be accessed via MyTurn at myturn.ca.gov or by calling 833-422-4255. Uh, and they're available four days uh, before the date of the event. Uh, you can visit the county's website at smchealth.org backslash COVID vaccine for weekly uh, event center vaccination days and other vaccination resources. You can also contact your healthcare uh, provider or pharmacy for more, for more vaccination appointments and resources. Uh, homebound residents can contact my turn or their healthcare provider for information on scheduling an in-home uh, vaccination appointment. appointment. Uh, so hopefully uh, everybody is uh, is in process uh, or has already received their uh, vaccine as this will be critical uh, towards moving through uh, through the uh, uh, COVID crisis and uh, reopening all our uh, businesses and our events. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any questions from council? So I, I, I just, <laughs> um, so I, I have a question and um, if uh, Chief uh, Bell is on the line, um, I'll direct this to her. I, I received a number of feedbacks from the community with respect to uh, burglaries and a concern that um, break-ins and um, you know some of those types of car break-ins are might be up in our community, and I understand that uh, uh, part of that may be due to the fact that uh, arrests and bookings are not occurring uh, due to the COVID crisis. And I was just wondering if there might be an opportunity for us to get an update at, about that at, at an upcoming meeting to understand the situation and uh, you know help, help the community understand and make sure that we're taking care of things as it were. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Chief Bell uh, earlier and uh, she said she would be happy to uh, pull together that information for a future presentation if the council was interested um, and she would reach out to the uh, district attorney's uh, office in the courts uh, to get the latest information on uh, what's happening um, uh, within the uh, judicial system in our county. Great, thank you. Uh, is is there interest among other council members for such a report? Yes, I'll say yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, all right. And I heard uh, council member Rack. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. If you could let her know, it sounds like there we do have interest in wanting to understand the situation and when things may return hopefully back to normal uh, once vaccines are rolled out. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so the next item is a study session. Um, item 9A will receive an update on the status of state legislation that may impact the city and provide staff uh, uh, with direction. We'll be taking a report from Tara Peterson, Assistant City Manager, and Amy Brown, the city legislative lobbyist from ARC Strategies. Tara? Good evening, Council. Um, if Amy and Colin can turn on their, yeah, it looks like they're 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 all ready to go. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce them. We have Amy Brown and Colin Holiday, both from Arc Strategies in Sacramento, and they are our representatives up in Sacramento on all things legislative. So, without further ado, I'll just turn it on over to her. Oh, great. You're going to handle the slides for us. That's good. You don't want me in charge of slides. Thank you, um, everyone. Amy Brown, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Colin Hawley. We um, are a, a contract lobbying firm that has been representing the city of San Carlos for a number of years on legislative and um, budget issues before the state capital office for quite some time. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we'll kind of go over what uh, we're discussing today in addition to other things. So these are some of the capital highlights that we want to cover for you. 
um, that are sort of front and center uh, as it relates to uh, city uh, impacts uh, of whatever the state is deciding to do, whether it be budget or um, you know pending legislation. But before I, I get started, a couple of things. One, Colin and I will be sort of toggling back and forth uh, um, as we go over these slides. What I would hope is that um, if you have questions uh, about that slide, ask us sort of real time um, and not wait till the end because I, knowing me, I'll probably forget what I say. So these slides are actually keeping um, me focused on what we're discussing. And then before we kind of get into uh, the, the body of uh, what's going on this year because it's an unprecedented year and it's making you know all of our heads spin uh, you, We can predict a whole host of things going on in the legislative process and those predictions will uh, fly out the window But let me give you a little download on where we are in terms of the legislative process this session So we're almost halfway through um, session this year. We're in the first year of a two-year uh, legislative session so this year on February 19th um, was the bill introduction deadline and we saw probably close to 3,000 um, bills and we, you know, sort of went through all of them, flagged them for, um, you know, uh, city uh, staff to review. The city has taken some positions on some of the bills that are still making their way through the legislative process. We'll talk about that. Uh, but what is significant about the timing is that um, Next week on the 21st, the, uh, there's a legislative deadline for fiscal committees to pass bills to their respective board. So if, a, if an assembly bill is introduced in the assembly, it has to pass the, the appropriations committee and then it's sent to the assembly floor. At that time, June 4th is the last day for assembly bills to pass off of the floor and be shipped over to the uh, Senate to go through the same um, process and for the Senate to send the bills that were not defeated over to the assembly. Then it's kind of a race to the end. Um, September 10th is the last day for the legislature to act on any pending legislation. And if for whatever reason, those bills don't get the requisite votes, uh, to pass off of the floor and are sent to the governor's desk. They are considered to your bills and will likely be uh, revived in January of 2022. Um, on September 20, uh, September 10th, the governor has exactly 30 days to either sign or veto the uh, bills uh, that are on his desk. And so we'll know the fate of our world um, by uh, uh, October 10th of this year. Now, in the midst of all this, and you guys certainly know, there um, is a pending recall afoot. Um, the recall uh, signature campaign uh, was an effort by proponents who wanted to recall the governor and they had to gather 1.45 million signatures, valid signatures, for it to qualify. Um, in, on May 5th, the Secretary of State validated uh, 1.7 signatures. So we can all assume that uh, a, a recall is gonna be on a ballot um, probably in likely October or November of this year. But what's happening now is whoever signed the, the recall petition has until June 8th to request their signature be removed. Um, you know, I've all, we've only seen one recall effort in the last 20, 22 years that, that I've been lobbying the state legislature. I, you know, the likelihood of, of people pulling their signatures off by June 8th is, is pretty slim. So we can assume that a date for a recall um, will be set October or November, but that um, sort of gives a political viewpoint of, you know, where the governor is and, and sort of his public uh, reactions to a lot of um, what's going on here. And I wanted to mention that because that's about a, a lot of what people are talking about. 
Um, the, you know, we don't know who is going to be on the recall ballot. So for those of you who were around during the Gray Davis it, um, recall, you were, and you, you voted, you were, you know, asked, do you support the recall or do you oppose it? And then ir irrespective of that answer, then you would pick um, a, a candidate uh, in the case of, of the recall passing. During the Great Davis recall, I think there were about 55 to 60 um, candidates on that ballot. It was a little bit of a circus, and um, we're, we're speculating that uh, a lot of folks will uh, put their names on the ballot, um, and we'll let you know about uh, when that happens and what, you know, where those candidates are going to sort of fall um, as it relates to a November, uh, October, and November election. So um, here's what I wanted to talk about. If you go to the next slide, we are really, um, this is kind of, uh, you know, hot off the presses. So this morning, uh, the governor uh, made a, a press announcement uh, kind of rolling out his comeback plan. Now, backing up, he um, he issued a proposed budget in January uh, that spelled out, you know, what his, uh, you know, um, recommendations were and where that put the money, the, the proposed money that they think they were going to get is going to, he, he wants to spend. Then in May, um, he issues a May revise based on the revenues that are actually coming into the state. Between that time, the Senate and the Assembly budget committees are negotiating and having hearings on, you know, what the governor put out in January and also what their priorities are from both houses, right? And so the May revise will come out Friday the 14th, this Friday. But what's interesting about this is the governor had a press conference today announcing his comeback planner. And these are some of the things that we picked up. Um, you know, his projections uh, of 75.7 budget uh, surplus. Let me just stop there and, and sort of tell you how this is so incredibly, um, you know, something that no one could predict last year. Last year at this time when we were in the, in starting in the middle, sort of in the middle of COVID, we were facing a $54 billion state budget deficit. And, uh, you know, the, the, there were several cutbacks proposed to a lot of statewide um, programs. And what started to happen in late last year as we were sort of coming out of COVID was because of the federal stimulus funding that we were getting, because the state was deferring um, some of their uh, financial obligations and, um, you know, because the wealthy ha households, right, that are paying state taxes, were prospering during this COVID time. The stock market soared mid-pandemic. -pa I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. Real estate um, prices have gone up. What we're seeing now is an unprecedented surplus in the, in, to the tune of $75.7 um, billion in surplus. This doesn't include the 26 billion in, in federal funds. So if you look on this slide, you'll see where the governor's priorities are on this. I will tell you that just because these are his priorities, it doesn't necessarily translate to the legislature passing, uh, the assembly and Senate passing a similar budget. They may have, and we well know, they have different um, priorities and may not you know, support this or the numbers that are associated with um, what he's uh, projecting. But the 12 billion uh, in tax rebates for California residents is significant. You'll probably see that on the news tonight and into the rest of the week. Um, for those making less uh, $75,000 or less who didn't receive a, a first payment under the Golden State Stimulus Plan. So he's trying to get at sort of the, the middle class of Californians and really the, the uh, State Department of uh, Finance um, uh, with the governor's office is anticipating that this the $600 that he'll be giving um, or the state will be allocating really affects two thirds of California residents. Um, 
So that's significant. There's 5.2 billion in uh, that he's proposing in rental assistance for back rent and future rent for several months um, for those uh, you know who had a, a, a rent um, mor a moratorium on evictions, and then 11.2 billion for the rainy day uh, reserves that is um, in the constitution, and then a, a whopping 26.6 billion towards Prop 98. That's the um, K through 12 education uh, requirement that the general fund has to allocate. And then 38.1 uh, billion for, uh, set aside for future programs. And programs that were slated to be cut last year because of the $54 billion deficit that we were facing. We'll know more on Friday, but I will just mention, um, you know, in, in 79, this is fa fascinating. In, in 1979, the GAN limit was implemented and it basically said that residents are owed a, a tax rebate when revenues outpace uh, um, outpace spending on taxpayer funded programs state programs um, it has the GAN limit hasn't been triggered since 1986 uh, and what happens if it is triggered and they're speculating that it will be is that half will be paid to you know k through 12, 12 education and the other half will be paid to taxpayers directly. Um, so that kind of gives you an overview on where we are budget-wise. People are really shaking their heads going, this is unbelievable. But I will tell you that the some of the struggles that we're gonna be facing um, in future years is that you know a lot of the folks in the governor's office as well as legislators are talking about the you know, population decrease in California. And, um, you know, it's affecting uh, average daily attendance in schools, um, you know, and they're gearing it to their, their reasoning the 0.46% slip in our population growth, which, which isn't a growth at all, uh, is due to birth rates on the decline, people leaving the states because of, you know, housing costs and standard of living here in California. And then they also attributed to COVID deaths that we've experienced this past year. So it's gonna be interesting how, you know, it, um, this budget is gonna address some of those issues as we move forward. So I'll stop there and see if, if um, folks have questions. If not, we can move to the next slide. Okay, so- Amy, I'm Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So um, this is what we're talking about in terms of house, housing and homelessness. You know, uh, we were asked to sort of present an overview on housing and homelessness, but also include some of the other issues um, that are going on in the legislature that would affect the city of San Carlos. Um, according to uh, the governor's uh, proposal for housing and homelessness, in his proposed budget, uh, you know, he's continuing the effort to allocate uh, funds for counties and cities uh, to tackle uh, housing and homelessness issues. This year, um, he's looking at, to propose 1.75 billion for three programs: vulnerable adults and seniors, behavioral health infrastructure, and then Home Key. Home Key may ring a bell for you all. Um, you know, last year we were able to acquire, um, you know, 600 million to 750 million that went uh, to counties, uh, um, cities with, a, 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 you know, populations of higher than 300,000, but also cities uh, below that population thre threshold on a per capita basis. And so that is gonna continue um, th he's also proposing, the governor's also proposing a one-time allocation uh, for maintenance acquisition on these uh, homeless and housing projects, but the ongoing costs, you know, they've, they've made it very clear, uh, should be borne by the local agencies who are the recipients of the, these funds. There's um, economic recovery uh, uh, proposal items that um, the governor's office has recommended 1.5 billion for infrastructure and incentives for zero emission vehicle goals, 
um, uh, 1.1 immediate relief for small businesses. You'll hear a lot about that. Um, and then there's some for the California Jobs Initiative and Workforce Development. So this is job training, connecting uh, folks who have been, um, you know, just their, their uh, employment, you know, been displaced uh, because of COVID. They're, you know, pulling those people back and uh, really finding them a spot. Incidentally, the um, governor's uh, office on um, business and economic development is really looking at this um, issue of restaurants not being able to keep up with um, the demand in terms of hiring now that they're reopening. So there's a lot of um, activity that uh, that office is called GoBiz, what GoBiz is doing. And then lastly, um, 300 million in deferred maintenance and greening of state infrastructure. So that's an that's an incentive-based program to, you know, sort of update some of the infrastructure projects as it relates to um, going green. So um, the a couple of things to mention that are not on this slide, but uh, bears mentioning the big city mayors group has recently sent a letter. Um, to uh, the um, the budget committee uh, chair uh, uh, chairman of both houses as well as leadership of both houses requesting uh, 4.8 billion billion in flexible homeless funds to be used over a two year period and um, had suggested that the state develop a state funded uh, resilience corporation jobs program for struggling young adults. So don't be surprised if that, you know, issue sort of comes to head over the next couple of weeks. I will say too that the legislature uh, needs to pass and send uh, a budget down to the governor's office for signature by June 15th. So we're, you know, sort of in a time crunch. By May 14th, when the May revise comes out, that's when things are going to start rocking and rolling. So Let's go to the next slide. A Amy, we've got a question from Council Member Rack and then. Um... Yeah. Thanks, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, Amy, thanks for going through this. Uh, just a question on the, the big city mayor letter that you meant, just mentioned in terms of the um, homelessness and uh, sort of job funding. Is that. Uh, you know, targeted only for big cities? Is it, do you, know, do you have any understanding of the structure of what they're asking for? Is that something that the county here or that we as San Carlos could potentially benefit from? You know what, the details um, are not outlined in the letter. It's just a request uh, from those mayors in those 13, um, you know, uh, big cities, the, the most populated cities. Um, but what I will do is I'll ha be happy to send a copy of that letter uh, to Tara and Jeff, so um, you guys can take a, a look at what they're um, sort of, you know, uh, targeting in terms of allocation. They want as much flexibility as possible. And so okay. remember last year when the big city mayors, and the year before that, um, when the big city mayors really pushed the, you know, the, <clears throat> the governor when he was first elected in 2018, um, you know, they asked, they requested um, direct allocations for housing and homelessness funding as it related to home key and room key. And that ended up sort of being uh, distributed uh, from a countywide basis, from a large city basis, and then also on a per capita basis for those cities below, uh, I think it was 300,000 population. So I'll send that over to you. It's a, it's a general ask. Um, and we're not, uh, we don't know if the conversations that the big city mayor's group has been having with the governor's office and some members of the legislature, as well as the Department of Finance, has evolved into specifics on their ask. But we're happy to share that information. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, next slide. All right, we're rocking and rolling here on um, uh, building housing opportunities for all. So let me give you a little bit of context, and this is where Colin and I are going to go back and forth. So last year, and this this is sort of the the the, the politics of of the legislative process. So last year, the Senate 
put together a, a, a working group with, I would say, six or seven senators who were authors of uh, Senate bills that dealt with sort of, you know, streamlining CEQA, some of the, some of the bills they inter introduced last year, cities didn't like because it required um, ministerial approval, which was reintroduced uh, that we'll talk about. And, and these were sort of on the Senate side packaged up because the president of the Senate, Tony Atkins, this is a high priority for her. And so that Senate uh, stakeholder group um, put a, a working group together and formed sort of a, a package of bills. Those bills passed through the Senate and then were um, sent to the assembly side for uh, consideration. At the end of session, most of the Senate bills died on the assembly floor because of gamesmanship between the assembly and Senate. You always get caught up in the politics of, you know, the assembly's priorities uh, oftentimes are very different than the Senate's. And so they'll, you know, sort of, um, from a timing perspective, hold some issues that are really important to the Senate to make sure their issues on the, uh, uh, their assembly issues that are on the uh, Senate floor are passed. There's a lot of negotiations involved. At the end of the day last year, um, a number of bills died on the Senate floor and just weren't taken up. And if you kind of look at the history uh, online, you wouldn't be able to understand why the assembly floor didn't vote on a number of these issues. So they're at it again, right? So now we're in 2021. There's, this, is, this is the Senate bill package, same working group, um, but, but this is sort of the package that, you know, uh, for, and, and it's on the, you know, we've, we've had conversations with the, the, you know, pro tem and, and her staff. This is something that is, is clearly uh, a priority for, um, Senate leadership and those who are authoring these bills. So let's run through these, uh, real quickly. So. SB6, um, this is a residential development on existing commercial zones with some requirements. So this is a, a bill that is um, authored by uh, a Senator Caballero from the Central Valley. And um, it, it essentially, ex the bill until 2029, so there's a sunset, enacts the Neighborhood Homes Act which basically authorizes housing on any parcel zone for office or retail use. So, um, you know, there's a, a lot in here in terms of what cities can and can't do uh, with regard to the, you know, housing um, uh, ability to zone in uh, commercial and, and retail areas. Um, but th this is a, a, a hot issue. It's currently in the Senate Appropriations Committee. We will find out its fate um, on Thursday, May 20th. If it passes off of the suspense file, it'll go to the uh, Senate floor and then it'll um, go through uh, the uh, Assembly Housing Committee and uh, Local Government Committee uh, and be scrutinized over on the Assembly side. Um, Colin, do you want to take a crack at SB7? Uh, good evening, everyone. SB7 is Tony Atkins, the Senate Pro Tem's bill. Uh, this bill reenacts the Jobs and Economic Improvement through Environmental Leadership Act of 2011. It expands the Act's eligibility to include smaller housing projects till January 1. 2026. Um, essentially, the Environmental Leadership Development Projects, the ELDPs, which are LEED certified and clean energy projects. Uh, this is in its assembly third reading file on the assembly side. It's Tony Atkins' main bill here on the, the housing portion. It's gone through Senate EQ with 5 and 0 vote, Senate Appropriation 6 and 0. So, this is definitely something they're building on there. Um, Amy, is there anything that I'm missing? No, that's yeah, that's it. That's moving along as well. You know, I, just as a side, I don't think if I'm going to do the crystal ball, I don't think any of the bills that you see on this slide 
are going to be stopped in the Senate. If anything, um, they're going to be hotly debated on the assembly side because of the contentious um, nature in which a lot of these bills died last year. So expect these to continue throughout the process. And just um, as this, there's only 17 approved projects right now that are ELDPs and no affordable housing through this as well so far. So real quick, um, SB8, it, it simply extends the Housing Crisis, Crisis Act of uh, 2019. So there was a bill that was passed, SB uh, 330, um, that it, uh, you know put a lot of these prohibitions and um, conditions on um, housing, uh, the, the, stream, the development of housing. And this extends it to, um, 2030. So the Housing Crisis Act, the bill, the, the bill that is is in, in appropriations right now, um, it builds upon, you know, SB 330 and basically prohibits certain local actions that would reduce housing capacity. Um, it prohibits down uh, zoning unless the city or county concurrently up zones an equal amount elsewhere. It prohibits a local agency from applying new rules or standards to a project after a pre uh, preliminary application containing um, the information. It's all of the things that the city has to adhere to now. Um, it just extends the sunset to 2030. So that's that one. Um, and then uh, let's see, SB9, actually the city of San Carlos has a, an official opposed unless amended position on SB9. This is again, the uh, president of the Senate, Tony Atkins, um, is authoring this bill. Um, the city has an opposed unless amended, so does the League of Cities and several other um, cities. And basically what it does, it's, it would require a local government to, uh, you know, sort of ministerially approve a housing development containing two residential units in single family residential zones. And it would also require local governments to approve, um, you know, urban lot splits. And so, you know, the, the, the city and the league had um, issued letters and there's been conversations about, you know, allowing local governments more flexibility with regard to constructing um, you know, two residential units and not two residential units and an additional accessory dwelling unit on the same parcel. Um, so the, those discussions, because this bill is moving so rapidly through the Senate process, those discussions are going to be a lot more, um, uh, they're going to be sort of considered um, when and if SB9 run in, runs into, you know, problems on the um, assembly side, whether it be the assembly housing committee and or the assembly local government um, committee. So, you know, there, the pro tem uh, is very well aware of um, the opposition, uh, but, you know, that we'll, we'll see how that goes. Amy, we've got a question from council member Rack. Go ahead. Well, I, actually, I'm happy to wait till she finishes SB 10 and just ask when we're done with that housing piece, if that's okay, Madam Mayor. Yep. So, um, Colin, you want to hit up SB 10? Yeah, SB 10, Senator Scott Winters, he's the chair of the housing committee over in the Senate. This is his SB 50 light, if you were following that debate and conversation last year, essentially. It's allows city to zone a parcel to 10 units of residential density in areas close to job centers, transit, the existing urbanized without CEQA and CEQA exemptions. Essentially, it's the kind of building density around public transit and job centers. It's He's referencing the lack of CEQA review based upon ADUs. He's using the same examples in his analyses. Um, Tony Atkins and him have been going after this for a long time now, and this is his SB 50 light, another bite of the apple from this. Yeah, so. So this is more of a, a carrot versus stick, but go ahead, um, Council Member Rack. Thank you. Um, so I just had a question. It's not, I know you said SB9 is something we've taken a position on. Is that something that I know it sounds like Jeff's done that or the city staff has recommended that? 
did we send a, or did Jeff sign a letter that we sent in or how do we sort how did we indicate our opposed unless amended on that do we know yeah a, a letter uh, yeah a letter from um signed by uh Jeff was submitted okay and then can you give me a sense of the if we wanted to weigh in on all these and let's say potentially send a letter from the council or from the mayor if, if that was what the will of the council was what's the timing that we need to sort of get that in to have any in fact, it sounds like it's sort of targeting the assembly at this point right. um, with these. And we're running out of time. I, I mean, some of these, I think, are, are they're just tying our hands and their ability to do anything on housing ourselves based on what our needs are in, in, our, in San Carlos versus what the state decides to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say you've got some time because these bills, um, you know, are going to make their way to <clears throat> uh, their second house. And so by June 4th, you know, is a good time to engage. Okay. So get so. letters in by June 4th is what you're saying? Or, or shortly thereafter. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Just because we only have so many council meetings in between. So I just want to make sure I understand the timing. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're going to um, kind of speed this along because it's getting late and um, I want to make sure we uh, handle everything. So we wanted to mention the, the uh, sort of latest and greatest on recycling organic waste that you know, there was a, a, a bill that was passed in 2016 that put a number of requirements on local governments to reduce um, landfill uh, disposal of organic waste and increase composting. The um, California Air Resources Board uh, had to take, you know, uh, write uh, and uh, implement a number of regulations to take effect on January 1, 2022. You know, it's really expensive and um, there's a lot of requirements. And so the league and the California State Association of Counties, as well as the um, Regional uh, Council of Rural Counties and California Against Waste uh, submitted a request for $225 million for state budget uh, implementation. At the same time, um, there's a bill, SB 619, authored by Senator John Laird out of San, uh, Santa Cruz that would extend um, the requirements, the, the regulations and requirements from the ARB, Air Resources Board, until 2023, and the penalties wouldn't apply until then. And the penalties wouldn't apply if a local government, um, you know, did everything to comply with um, uh, the efforts put forth by those regulations. All right. Let's move on. Here um, are a couple of real quick highlights um, that we wanted to put in front of you in terms of key bills that you either may know of or may get questions about. So Colin, real quick, if you can talk about uh, 339. Yeah, it's an assembly appropriation. It was amended on the 4th of this month. Essentially, everybody knows the Brown Act, but it wanted to include translation services in a bunch of different languages. This was a huge cost concern for many of the cities in San Carlos as well. It was amended to affect cities with population over 250,000. So that's essentially what we're dealing with in that bill. Yeah, so it doesn't affect the city of San Carlos anymore. SB2, hotly uh, debated and very controversial bill as it relates to the decertification of uh, police officers and addresses serious misconduct after hours and hours of debate in um, the Senate Judiciary Committee this past week, um, they're looking to uh, amend this bill so it's they have some workable standards in uh, the Bain Act. Um, during the committee, you know, they they looked at specific intent, um, and they're looking at sort of replacing that with a uh, you know disregard or deliberate indifference. Uh, of of um, uh, misconduct by police. You know, the law enforcement groups, and as some of you may know, our firm also represents the uh, California Police Chiefs Association, so we're right in the middle of some of those discussions. A lot of those law enforcement groups uh, are, are looking to amend um, part of the decertification bill so uh, it works for um, the Police Chiefs Association and um, other law enforcement. So we'll the, the bill will likely uh, come out of Senate appropriations very different than what it looks like now. And go ahead on 14 and 34. I think you can mention these real briefly in terms of the broadband efforts. 
Yeah, everybody knows um, the broadband is a huge issue for the California State Legislature right now. So essentially AB 14, it funds the California Advanced Services Fund. It, it increases speeds in underserved areas from 25 megabytes per second to 100 megabytes per second. Essentially, that's the big issue there. Uh, AB 34 broadband for all, it's a $10 billion, billion dollar voter approved bond. The stick here is uh, kicking the can down the road with more costs for people. Uh, when you have this majority in there, they have to pass bonds and vote on bonds. It's gonna put people in a little bit of a precarious situation, especially with a 70 plus billion dollar uh, surplus. So those two things kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, both bonds and tax increases are are, are going to, um, you know, be hard fought this year through the legislative process because you just can't um, make the argument that the legislature should pass those. The last one um, we were asked to mention, uh, SB 314, another uh, bill by Senator Wiener. This expands, um, you know, current temporary catering permits and extends from 30 to 90 days to apply for an ABC license for events. And then it also increases the number of permits from 24 to 52 where ABC can issue uh, one of those permits to use it at uh, the same location. And then the next slide, we do not have to go over these, but these are, and I'll, I'll just, um, you know, real quick, these are the positions that the city has taken on um, specific legislation. The, um, and so if you have questions on those, uh, give a shout out, um, but, um, and we can talk about uh, where the, the bills are, um, lay of the land kind of thing. But, um, you know, the, the city has issued uh, the following positions on these bills. Thank, and we thank you, Amy. Letters there as well. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll take um, uh, final council questions and then we'll go to public comment and then we'll come back for council comments. So council member Collins question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Amy. Uh, very thorough presentation. Uh, uh, how many bills did you say? 3,000? Something like that. That's yeah, just... Hopefully there will be, you know, a lot of them will be dead after. Yeah. I can't, I can't even wrap my head around that. Can you just give me your impression as to uh, which way SB9 is headed uh, at this point? Well, it's a, it, that's hard because, you know, SB9 is the uh, Senate President Tony Atkins, um, one of her, you know, priorities. And so if any of the amendments that the League and the City of San Carlos and others are uh, proposing, um, those will not be, in my opinion, politically, those are not going to be um, con really considered by way of amendments until this bill um, goes before the, you know, Assembly uh, Local Government Committee as well as the Assembly um, Housing Committee. And so, you know, it's too soon to tell uh, how SB9 is going to shape up and what form it's going to look like at the end of the day and yeah. whether or not it passes the assembly at all, because, yeah. you know, it, the, it, you know, it didn't, it, it died at the end of session last year. So we'll see what happens. Same question for SB 210. That seems so draconian to yeah. require yeah. records be destroyed in a day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, I'm, hopeful knock on wood that um th the automated license plate reader data bill that you know you have to destroy the you know the records in 24 hours this is a scott wiener bill and his you know when he introduced this bill it was on the premise that ice is get it, ice is getting this information and, and using it to uh you know track down un undocumented workers um, I believe, uh, based on the hard work that our, um, that we have done on this and others, is that we have a good shot of amending it significantly while it's in appropriations. So you're not looking at 24 hours, you're looking at, you know, 30, maybe 60 days. I mean, don't hold me to that, but... You know, we're having some really hard conversations with um, the author and 
you know, are working really hard to, to, you know, get the um, right amendments in uh, before it gets up out of appropriations. And if we're not successful there, we'll have a better shot of, you know, either killing it or defeating the bill or getting the amendments that we seek um, on the assembly side. The California Police Chiefs Association is front and center on um, their opposition and they're working this bill very hard. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. You, Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Laura, I have I have questions on four pieces of legislation. May I ask all four? Would you like me to do two and then um, come back on the other two? Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. I, I, I have a couple of questions, but I, I don't see any other hands. So we go ahead, Vice okay, Mayor. Thank you. And, and I, will, I will be brief. I will be brief, I promise. Um, Amy and Colin, thank you very much for your time tonight. The first question that I have is on AB 773, street closures and designations. Um, I'm not sure how closely you follow news in San Carlos, but we have closed our downtown Main Street, um, a block of it to accommodate parklets. And I'm wondering um, how, I, I see that slow streets is mentioned in this bill. Would, would this pertain at all to closing a street for parklets? That I do not know, but I am going to, the, the analysis on the Committee on Local Government allows local authorities to close portions of streets to through vehicular traffic and to designate uh, streets as slow streets. So there's an analysis that um, the Local Government uh, Committee had uh, written quite recently on May the 4th. And I will send that to Tara so she um, can get it out to you. The, in terms of the um, where the bill is, I think it's on the floor of the assembly, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to send this analysis, and I bet if you read if, and I'll read the analysis as well um, tonight. But I bet if we review um, the analysis that your question will be answered. And I'm sending that to Tara right now. Okay, great, thank you. Seven, seven, three. Yep, okay, next question is AB 1029. Um, that's Mullen's bill, housing elements, pro-housing, local policies. And it says this bill would add the preservation of affordable housing units to the list of specified pro-housing local policies. Um, and I am especially interested in preserving um, naturally affordable um, multifamily housing units. Um, and I, I would love to know if this puts us on track to somehow start counting preservation of naturally affordable units toward arena numbers. I think it does, but do not uh, hold me to that answer. Um, I'm gonna uh, do a little digging and see if I can answer that question for you uh, with authority. And I'm looking okay. at it right now. Um, the bill is in appropriations, and so we'll find out whether or not it's going to uh, come out of appropriations um, next week. But in the meantime, um, give me a you know a day or two to answer your question. And in the meantime, I'm also going to send. Um, Tara, the analysis. Okay, perfect. Um, my next question, uh, you touched on this briefly, was um, modernizing the Brown Act and various bills that um, are being considered. And um, this is also a topic that I'm especially interested in because, um, you know, we've seen so an increase in public participation now that we're online and we can accommodate um, remote um, public comment. So, um, I know uh, that AB 703 is a two-year bill, and so I'm just concerned about what is coming in the near term for the smaller cities and how we can get in front of that and really advocate at the state level, um, how we can modernize the Brown Act, calling in from a remote, remote location. And also, it would be great to um, take away the provision that you have to post a notice and leave your front door open if a council member is participating remotely. So. I'm wondering if you can shed some light if that's included anywhere where we can. Yeah, advocate. it's a little passe. I think what you're going to see over the next year, not this year, because 
you know, the, the 70, AB 703, um, yeah, that, that's a two-year bill. And the author is um, actually the chair of the uh, Assembly Moderate Caucus. So, um, you know, she's been wanting to address this issue for quite some time. My recommendation would be to put, a, you know, sort of a general list of, um, a, you know, sort of guiding principles and practices around this as we move into the next sort of, you know, um, era of, uh, you know, public meetings under the Brown Act. Um, I don't think you'll see a lot of sort of AB 339 bills before they admitted it to just apply, you know, to um, those larger cities. Uh, but, and, and of course, 703 is a, a two-year bill, but there's gonna be a lot of discussion. And so what I would recommend to the city is you know, be sort of at the forefront of those discussions before those bills are introduced or reintroduced. And, and you know, if, if there's a way to sort of, um, you know, summarize what kind of changes that you want to see in the future as we, you know, sort of um, transition to more of a technological based um, Brown Act type public hearing, um, that would be, you know, your, your, uh, my recommendation would be, be like, you know, sort of proactive before mm -hmm. reacting to some of these um, bills that may either not work for the city or are very onerous either by, you know, um, not making sense um, additional staff time or the finances around the requirements. Okay, no, I, I, I appreciate that perspective. My final question is SB 314. I was the one who asked for the update on that. And I noticed that your update was about catering, but that's not um, the reason that I asked for it to be brought back. It was because it also um, allows current licensees with outdoor dining, expanded premises under ABC's emergency relief um, order a grace period of one year. Um, basically it allows alcohol to continue to be served out in parklets. And again, this is something that San Carlos is knee deep in because we have so many parklets on our main street and um, doing away with, with this exemption or you know, no longer being able to serve alcohol to customers dining outside would be a big problem. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering where that stands in, in that capacity, not for catering. You know, we've, um, we've had some discussions with the, the Senator who's offering this bill and this is one of probably a handful of bills that extend those, uh, you know, sort of temporary restaurant provisions um, at long term. And it's and, and what we're hearing from the governor's office, for instance, it's not just this bill that I think has a good chance of um, sort of moving forward in a, sort of a quasi permanent way because there are so many restaurants throughout California that had to shut their doors permanently. So this is sort of a, an economic um, revitalization uh, bill, but there are others, right? Where the governor um, issued an executive order and then there was some legis emergency legislation passed last year that allowed for you know, um, takeout to include uh, alcoholic beverages or, mm -hmm you know, when you have that third party delivery uh, system to have, you know, alcohol be beverages be a part of that. That is sort of an entire larger discussion about the legislature and the governor's office talking about what can we do to um, sort of keep, you know, it, it going where we sort of incentivize restaurants to stay open. And this, and SB 314 is definitely one of those. So I think this has a good chance of continuing through the legislative process. There are, you know, probably three or four other bills that are related to this. It doesn't deal with the, you know, sort of licensing and outdoor dining, but it does um, deal with some of the, um, you know, permanent restrictions on, you know, how, uh, restaurants, how and when restaurants uh, serve alcohol to their uh, patrons. And I think you're going to see a lot of changes with regard to that. Okay, great. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll reserve the rest of my comments um, about housing policy for after the discussion. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Amy, just a couple of quick questions. So um, SB 9 is a little confusing to me because the state just updated their ADU and JDU guidelines and all the cities need to adopt them. So um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could provide a little bit of color on kind of the rationale for that. And then um, in a similar fashion, the RENA numbers came out uh, recently for all of the cities and we're updating our housing element now. And we've been told that we need to make sure our plans accommodate a 20, 2,700 additional units, which is a, basically a 30% increase um, in our housing stock. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're right in the midst of conversations right now with our community about that. Um, and I'm wondering if you could also provide a little bit of color um, on the rationale for that, just given the, the much increased RENA numbers that came out. Well, you know, um, that's, you know, to assume that uh, bills that are introduced have some sort of uh, rationale around them, right? Um, and, you know, I think tongue in cheek, I'd probably be out of a job if rational thought were uh, a part of the legislative process with regard to bill introductions. But, um, you know, I think this is separate and apart from, you um, you know, those those updated regulations in terms of the uh, RENA requirements. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, clear if that conversation uh, with regard to SB9 was um, or has been discussed with the Pro Tem's office. I'm happy to follow up and um, get sort of their responses to, you know, why you're doing this when, I mean, this was an issue that you know, we debated um, when, you know, Senator Wiener issued, you know, introduced SB 50 that was an, eventually defeated. It, it was like, listen, we just passed laws that made, um, you know, the RENA requirements rather than guidelines, right? And so why, why are these um, bills sort of being dogpiled when we haven't even been able to really sort of implement and, you know, fulfill the requirements of the new uh, legislation. That I don't know um, in terms of like how this relates to, you know, HCD's involvement and, uh, you know, sort of what you need to do in order to fulfill your new arena requirements. So I am happy to sort of pose that and I'm sure that, um, I'm hoping that that conversation has occurred with the pro temp's office, but um, a lot of the times, you know, you, you introduce a bill and it's a part of your, you know, uh, sort of legislative priorities and you, you know, you're head down and you're moving forward on it. So I, I, I doubt, I doubt that, you know, the, the it, you know, HCD is really providing any sort of input um, with regard to your question on SB9. And yeah, I can, I, I gather it would be very frustrating considering the fact that this is, you know, a sort of a dog pile on the new requirements that you have to adhere to anyway. Thank you, Amy, I appreciate it. All right, Crystal, are there any comments from the public? No, I don't see any hands raised. Okay, so we'll move to the discussion and comment period. All right, Vice Mayor McDowell. Okay, I said I had comments, so I have a few. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I support legislation that modernizes the Brown Act. Um, I mentioned that public participation in our meetings has increased tremendously when residents can participate remotely. And I think we need to encourage that. And, um, you know, I do feel like antiquated parts of the Brown Act are really holding us back from operating in modern times. And we should support some common sense updates. And I would, um, you know, support advocating in that direction. Um, I also support legislation that helps cities navigate the post pandemic world with street closures and parklets. Um, which is why I brought up SB 314. Um, I think that I support legislation that comes from the state that makes it easier for cities to support our downtown businesses with parklets um, and not burying us in immediate expensive studies and red tape. So um, it'd be nice to see that the state could support us in that. 
I, with housing, this has come up quite a bit, um, especially from many of our residents. And I think there's a big difference between cities that refuse to work on housing and a town like San Carlos where housing is consistently at the top of our strategic goals year after year. And I'm not a fan of the heavy handed, handed approaches from the state that mandate how we San Carlos zones for housing when we are good actors in this process. We play by the rules and we work hard to make sure our zoning can accommodate our arena allocation. Um, Furthermore, on the topic of housing, I would like to advocate on a state level that preservation of naturally affordable housing units should count toward our arena goals. And I support the city getting out in front of that. Redwood City, I believe, is also interested in this topic. We can preserve naturally affordable housing much more quickly than building it from scratch. And it would be nice to have this option in our toolkit of affordable housing measures. So um, I'll leave it at that for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rack. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and I, uh, Amy and Colin, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, and I just would agree with all, everything the Vice Mayor had to say. And um, I would love to be able to, to see if we can, given the short time frame potentially, or to, to do this in the next one or two meetings, I would, uh, while I understand that the city has taken some positions and sent some letters, um, I think it's sometimes more powerful as, or you know, a, a nice, not that Jeff's not powerful in his voice, but um, that you know, if we as a council could make some decisions around some of these issues, I think that would be uh, a good next step, uh, potentially at the next meeting to try to get something drafted uh, quickly around these issues, because I do think they're important for us um, as a community for both our economic vitality in the community and, and uh, around housing as well. I do think we, we, we are doing our job around this and you know, we should be able to continue to do our job the way we think is uh, best for San Carlos. Thank you, Adam. Council Member Collins. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with uh, with Adam. I think that we should uh, give support to our city manager and make sure that, that we as a council, if, if we all agree, um, we send letters that support and suppose the, the, uh, the bills that we have uh, identified as uh, affecting San Carlos. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'll just chime in to say I, uh, the measures that we have taken a position on on the city, um, I support where the city has taken the positions, uh, especially around the housing measures. Uh, certainly, uh, we need to maintain uh, some degree of local control. We've certainly uh, been keeping housing a priority and are being good citizens around that. So uh, uh, I agree with my colleagues sentiment that um, uh, we should resist the, uh, the loss of uh, that control from Sacramento. Um, so I would uh, happily join a more formal process of, I guess, registering our, our position with a letter. If there's more we can do without significant distraction to us, we have a lot to deal with here in San Carlos. It's hard to get uh, two wrapped around dozens and dozens of issues in Sacramento, but when they do rise uh, to impacting us, uh, if there's things we can do, let's do it. Right. Thank you, Council Member Dugan. Council Member Collins. Yeah, I, I apologize. I just wanted to say uh, uh, thanks to Colin and, and Amy. I thought you guys are really on top of this stuff, um, and uh, we're we're very grateful that we have you in our corner. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'll add, um, you know, of concern to community members that have been shared with me is SB9 and SB10 in particular. Um, San Carlos recently updated our ADU and uh, JDU ordinance uh, to reflect uh, the most recent uh, contemporary state laws around that. Um, in addition, we're right in the midst of our um, updating our housing element where we're gonna have to make sure that our plan allows for 2,700 more units. So. I'm concerned about um, SB 10 from you know that perspective as well as well as the fact that the community has asked for that. So, I think perhaps you know targeting communications around those specifically. Um, I'm aligned uh, with Vice Mayor McDowell in terms of you know anything that will modernize the Brown Act to enable a greater participation. Um, what we what I have seen and observed is that. Uh, broader demographics um, and members of our community have been able to participate, uh, whereas, you know, trying to, you know, find a babysitter on a Monday night um, 
and come down to City Hall is not that convenient, or if somebody has uh, mobility impairment issues, um, you know, that's not uh, that great. And everybody now knows how to use Zoom, so uh, let's let's leverage that. And when it comes uh, to um, you know helping our our city navigate uh, the post-pandemic world and the local economy with restaurants, I'm in support of that. Although I would just ask that um, maybe there's more information provided around what specifically these. Um, uh, provisions are um, because we are in the middle of uh, trying to, you know, determine how to move forward uh, with our uh, Laurel Street uh, or outdoor dining program, I, I should say. So I'd like to just better understand that a little bit more. So thank you. All right. So uh, any other comment, Jeff? Do you feel like you have what you need from council on this particular item? Where did Jeff go? Is he there? Hey, Jeff. Sorry, just pushing buttons. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. I think we're good. We'll uh, prepare some uh, specific right. letters on legislation. And uh, I think what we'll do is place them on your consent calendar for the sake of time at the next meeting. And then the, if there are um, specific ones you want to pull off to discuss further at the meeting, um, we can approach it that way. Great. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you, Amy and Colin. Um, really appreciate your uh, taking the 3,000 uh, proposed pieces of legislation and digesting it for us and helping us understand the impacts in our community. Really very much appreciated, nicely done. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Okay, so with that, uh, we'll move to item 9B, discuss updates to the protected tree ordinance and provide direction to staff. Uh, we will be hearing from uh, Rusha and Danandi, Associate Planner, uh, I believe on this item. That is right. All right. And did I pronounce your, did I pronounce your name correctly, or uh, I apologize if I didn't? Yes, my name is Rucha Dandi. Thank you. Welcome, Rusha. Thank you. Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, good evening. My name is Rucha Dandi, Associate Planner, Planning Division. The next item before you tonight is a study session to discuss updates to the protected tree ordinance to provide direction to staff on the next steps. Before I begin the presentation, I would like to introduce the city retained arborist Stephanie Nisich from Biomass, uh, who is here to answer any technical questions at the end of the program. We also have with us principal planner Andrea Mardisic, who, who can help uh, answer any questions from the council as well. Hello, everyone. Well, welcome, Stephanie. Or is that Stephanie speaking? Yes, thank, yes, thank you, you, Madam Mayor. In today's presentation, I will be going through the background for the topic, objective of the presentation, comparative analysis with other cities, followed by some questions, uh, followed by some time for questions and public comments. In response to uh, growing citizen concerns uh, regarding protected tree removals, uh, the City Council directed staff to review certain areas of the existing protected tree ordinance in its March 2022 uh, uh, meeting. Particularly, the City Council directed staff to review increasing penalties for illegal protected tree removals and explore possibilities of requiring same species or in-kind tree replacement. These two are also the objectives of tonight's presentation and the study session. Before I dive into the presentation, I would like to define few terms uh, that will commonly occur throughout this presentation. Uh, first one, significant tree. Any tree uh, that is at least 36 inches in circumference measured at 48 inches above natural grade is termed as a, signif a significant tree in our ordinance. And then uh, a, a heritage tree, an indigenous tree whose size exceeds a specific circumference uh, based on species when measured again at 48 inches above natural grade is termed as a, a heritage tree. I would like to bring to your attention that some species are exempt from the, these regulations regardless of size, 
for example, a eucalyptus tree or a fruit tree. Next slide, please. The council expressed concerns regarding the current illegal tree removal fines as not being adequate to be a deterrent to protected tree removals and pruning. And therefore, council directed staff to compare the current fees and fines associated with the illegal tree removals with neighboring cities. So staff collected information by contacting uh, various neighboring cities, which I will go through in the next few slides. First, I would like to highlight the fees and penalties that uh, the city of San Carlos uh, applies for illegal tree removals. Uh, when an illegal tree is removed, um, tree removal permits are required with double application fees, uh, which amounts to around $530. A civil penalty of $2,500 or appraised value of tree, whichever is lower, is also required. Uh, additional to that, a replanting requirement is also required, including all uh, associated costs. In Redwood City, can you go back? Yeah, thank you. Next, in Redwood City, um, uh, when a tree is illegally removed or damaged, um, <clears throat> they are required to restore it to form a condition. Additionally, any illegal pruning, destruction of tree, failure to comply with any condition amounts to $500 fees. Any of these above in the Redwood City um, ordinance violation could be prosecuted as a misdemeanor, which accounts to around $1,000 in fees and six, six months in jail. In Menlo Park, a damaged tree fine um, is not to exceed $5,000 per tree. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whereas a uh, demise of heritage tree fine uh, shall not exceed $5,000 uh, per tree or appraised value, uh, whichever is higher. Next. In Belmont, fines and fees are currently being assessed, so we do not have a number, but they do levy um, penalties or remedy fees, removal fees or equal tree replanting requirement without the benefit of permits. In San Mateo, a replanting condition of 48 inches box tree is required, and in lieu fee of 2,500, which goes towards replanting fund uh, may be required. And additionally, if a party has a history of removing trees illegally, um, a $5,000 fee is required. Council expressed in, uh, interest in exploring the possibility and implications of requiring a same species replacement or in-kind tree replacement when a protected tree is illegally or legally removed. So as directed by staff, uh, as directed by council, staff evaluated various protected tree replacement policies for neighboring cities and I'll be going through them in the next few slides. First, uh, let's start with San Carlos. Uh, in San Carlos, <clears throat> when a protected tree is removed, um, uh, or uh, let's say an uh, oak tree is removed, a replacement of an oak tree may be required for private properties. However, I would like to bring to your attention that this requirement is just as a be best practice and is not included in an ordinance. Apart from an oak tree, a minimum size of 24 inch box specimen tree of species is required uh, where the size and location is approved by the community development director. In Redwood City, in-kind replacement is not required. Um, the replacement requirement is a one, one is to one 15 gallon size tree or its multipliers. Next slide. In Menlo Park, again, in-kind tree replacement is not required. Uh, to replace a heritage tree, um, the replacement tree has to be uh, chosen from a city approved uh, tree list or pay an in lieu fee, which is dependent upon the uh, tree trunk diameter. In Belmont, again, a minimum 15 gallon of tree replacement is required uh, from preferred species tree list 
or an uh, in lieu uh, planting fee might be required as established by the city council. <clears throat> in San Mateo, an in-kind tree replacement may be required, for example, an oak tree plant for an oak removal, similar to us, or a 24 inches box size selected from pre-approved planting list may be required. Next slide, please. To further analyze uh, the possibility of requiring an in-kind tree replacement, staff worked with the arborist to understand the advantages, disadvantages, and implications of an in-kind tree replacement. For the purpose of this ana analysis, it is assumed uh, that a protected tree is also a native tree. So first I would like to go through the advantages of requiring an in-kind tree replacement. First, um, a native or a heritage tree a species may provide habitat and food resources for local wildlife, unlike an uh, ornamental tree. Uh, there could be dep dependency of local wildlife on a particular native tree or uh, the maintenance require requirements for the tree in the existing location are already known. Therefore, it would be easier to maintain the tree. And uh, the location may be an ideal spot for the tree species to remain healthy and reach maturity. On the other hand, when we look at the disadvantages, the in-kind tree replacement may require additional reports to understand the feasibility of the species at a given location. The, uh, the tree species uh, may be dependent or is dependent on multiple pre-existing factors, such as conflict with existing utility lines, dependency on other existing trees on site, or it may be a fire hazard, which could be uh, found out through um, additional reports. Additionally, there would be um, additional uh, arborist costs for uh, to report and uh, additional staff time, again, to conduct these studies and review them. Next slide, please. In an effort to further review the current provisions of the Protected Tree Ordinance, staff began to identify other areas within the ordinance that could be revised. Staff found several topics that might be considered for review by the City Council. These include re-evaluating the reasons for tree removal, re-evaluating the City approved street tree list. This is because um, and when we looked at the list with the arborist, it was found that most of the trees or all, none of the trees on the list were native trees. And out of those two were invasive trees, uh, tree species, and therefore staff is recommending to re-evaluate the city approved street tree list. Then third, preparing a preferred tree list for private properties. I would like to bring to your attention that <clears throat> The city does not have a preferred tree list for private properties, and therefore um, applicants have a have a vast choice from which they could select a tree and uh, and and uh, propose replanting, which is only a 24 inch box tree. That is uh, the specification in our ordinance. Fourth, fourth is reviewing enforcement measures for current best practices. Uh, fifth, re-evaluating department responsibilities for protected tree removal permits. And sixth is creating a detailed information web page for easy nav navigation. Next slide, please. In terms of next steps, there are a couple of steps the council would, could go based on today's discussion. First, for increasing penalties and uh, the in-kind tree replacement, the two topics that we heard tonight in my presentation, um, and uh, for increasing penalties and in-kind tree replacement, you could uh, council could direct staff to bring, bring back detailed recommendations on only these two topics at an earlier date than um, comprehensive review, or second direct staff to conduct a comprehensive protective tree ordinance review, which staff is recommending tonight. If council directs staff 
to undertake a comprehensive protected tree ordinance review. Staff can work with the retail arborist firm to prepare a detailed scope and budget, which staff anticipates could take around six to seven months with assistance uh, from the arborist. And it is anticipated that the budget uh, could be used from the existing professional services budget. Next slide, please. The council has three alternatives tonight. First, to direct staff to conduct a comprehensive protective tree ordinance, as previously mentioned, uh, to review uh, with recommendations to consider before council and bring it back at a later date. Or second, to provide staff with alternative direction or third, to take new action. This concludes my staff presentation. Again, my name is Rucha Dade. I'm happy to answer any clarifying questions on my presentation and staff report. Uh, again, we also have with us the, the arborist Stephanie Nisich from Biomass and Andrea Margusic, planning uh, principal planner, to answer any technical questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rucha. So we'll take um, council uh, questions. We'll move to public comment and then come back for council discussion. Um, so it appeared that uh, Council Member Collins, your hand went up, then we'll go to Council Member Dugan and then Council Member Rack. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Arucha, very good presentation. Um, I'm gonna have a lot of comments later. I really only have one question right now, and that is the, um, the, the issue of preparing a preferred tree list for private properties. Can we, are we allowed to create a list of prohibited trees for private properties? Is that within our, our uh, realm of authority? Um, usually it's practices from what we have researched um, in different cities. Um, usually the best practice is to have a preferred tree list. Um, I have not seen any um, city with uh, a tree list where, which are prohibited. However, that could be a, a umbrella requirement, which says that any um, invasive tree will not be required or a fruit tree will not uh, not be allowed. I'm sorry. Um, I think that is what I have seen, but I can defer um, and I'll defer this question to Stephanie um, from what she has seen in other cities as well. Stephanie, if I have you had any experience with that? I have little experience with that. There are some cities that you cannot plant certain trees in certain areas, but the private property, it's a very sensitive, with my experience, it's very sensitive to tell people what they can and cannot plant on their property. You can most likely just highly recommend and educate is probably the biggest thing um, I will look into it and I will get back to you on that question because it is a very important question. Well, you know, my, my thinking around it is that there, there are some trees that have invasive root systems. They're not drought tolerant. They're brittle. The branches can fall off. I mean, the eucalyptus are a perfect example, but there's a whole laundry list of other trees. It just seems to me that there's just certain trees that are non-native that are inappropriate. could be, uh, you know, not only oh, unsightly, but they could be uh they could be dangerous down the road so that's that's why i, I asked my question thank you Council I, Member I, Collins. I see oh, okay i'm sorry, sorry madam mayor go ahead i i agree with you um councilman collins there are very dangerous trees um well yet i shouldn't say that in a sense there are trees that have higher risk right and right. eucalyptus trees do drop live green branches, they are self pruners, they are very unpredictable. And you're correct, there are uh, tree systems that have very invasive roots. And throughout, was it, I think it was the 70s, a lot of the track homes, they, that was what most of the cities put in the same trees. And now you're seeing years later, if those trees did survive, how many cracked and raised sidewalks there are um, right. there, I, I, we can come up with a list. I, if, if I'm directed to, to do so, to be a part of that, then, um, yes, okay. I'll, I'll leave it at that. 
All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Madam Mayor, that's all I have for the moment. Thank you. And I see uh, Greg turned on his camera, so I'm assuming uh, the attorney, city attorney has a comment. Yeah, I, I think it was partially covered there, but I, I think um, findings um, would, um, for the for public property and right-of-way trees and street trees, trees in the front yard, it'd be easier to make findings about what's appropriate and what's not, um, whether it's dangerous or a nuisance. You know, tree, certain trees drop things that can, people can trip on. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, bamboo trees. You know, there's all kinds of different trees that could be nuisances. Um, and then on the private property side, it might be more of a regulatory um, thing to mitigate some of the nuisance aspects, but you might be able to make findings to to prohibit a tree even on private property if it's sufficiently dangerous or a nuisance. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so I think it was uh, Council Member Dugan and then Council Member Rack. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just us taking a look at this, well, first, uh, um, uh, Racha, uh, welcome, uh, nice presentation. It's a, you're, You've joined us at a busy time, so uh, uh, we're, we're glad to have you in the planning department. Um, it seems like we're, you know, looking at this because there's a perception there's there must be some kind of problem. Um, do we have any data? Has this been a recent problem? I know there's been some concern over trees recently, but I'm not actually aware of any recent examples of illegal tree removal. Do we have any data on, on you know, are, are we trying to solve a real problem here? Yes, yeah, so uh, I, uh, we did some research uh, for the last five years. We have received um, only nine illegal tree removal complaints, which are all closed at this point. So um, that is the data I have at this point, but uh, if council directs, uh, we can do some more research. Okay, so nine over five years. Um, and then if, if you're a new resident of San Carlos, uh, you know, do we have any kind of education component? I mean, it seems to me you can move from a lot of places in this country to San Carlos and just be completely ignorant of the fact that, you know, we care as much as we do about trees. I'm just curious, what do we do as a city to kind of get the word out about this one. Um, uh, about the um, the protected tree ordinance that is existing or about this study session? No, um, no, about our existing ordinance. If we're gonna increase the penalties, it just, I, I would think that puts a greater burden on us to make sure people are aware of, of the city's you know, active enforcement of this, that's all. So I'm just curious, you know, is this something that hits our newsletter every year or two? Or, you know, how, how do we get the word out about all this? Uh, Andrea, could I defer sure. uh, Good evening, council members. Andrea Martisic, principal planner. Um, I would say that in the past, uh, there has been a lot of outreach uh, around this area. That's something we definitely uh, would like to include as part of this process, if we're directed to uh, move forward by the council. Um, you're exactly right that I would say most of the illegal removals uh, are by people who didn't really know that they needed to get a permit or they thought that if they just applied, that meant they could do it even if it hadn't been reviewed yet. Um, so one of the goals for staff is to be able to get this out there, um, both to uh, developers through our developer roundtable as well as um, citizens through a website um, and other outreach uh, methods that we might have, the newsletter um, and any other ideas that, that we can come up with. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Council Member Rack, and then we'll go to Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and Rucha, thanks for the presentation. Uh, very well done. Um, and so I guess one of the questions I had, maybe I think for uh, Stephanie is, the um i saw in the report about uh you know maybe it, it, there are times where it doesn't make sense to replace uh the same tree with the same with the same sort of uh species can you just talk a little bit about sort of why that's the case yeah sure um for example a redwood tree is a heritage tree it's one of the eight that you ha you have listed. San Carlos has listed. Uh, if there if it's growing, say in the front yard or the backyard of someone's home. Uh, by the way, can you hear me okay, everyone? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, if it's growing 
in the backyard or the front yard of someone's home and it's directly underneath the power line. Well, you wouldn't want to put another redwood tree there. It's going to just be topped year after year after year and it could eventually die. As same with uh, an, an example of a non uh, a non heritage tree would be a palm tree as well. Is a palm tree once you top it, it's dead. And um, to even elaborate, not just on the utility aspect, but it just is any tree, whether it's a coast live oak or um, the redwood tree again, if they need a lot of space to grow, that is the, the tallest tree. And it, in urban environment, maybe it won't get over 300 feet, but it could possibly get over 100, 120 mm -hmm. feet. And the branch is you know, 50 feet wide. Uh, so where is the space, not just for the health of the tree, um, but also how is that going to affect the, the, the city around it? Um, is it, is it going to pose like some type of hazard? So is it going to be healthy for the tree, but is it also going to be healthy for the urban environment as well? Is that, is that, um, would you like me to add more or does that answer? Your no, question? that's really helpful. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I had one other question. I have a number of comments and I'm glad we're taking up this discussion today. I think it's an important issue for us to be looking at. Um, and this is maybe for Greg or I'm not sure how. So um, as part of this, could we also, I guess, um, I, sort of following up on sort of council member Collins uh, comments about sort of non-indigenous trees. Could we, as part of this also, maybe set up an incentive program for people who would replace invasive trees with a certain list, a preferred list of trees. Um, maybe we give somebody a few hundred dollars or $500 a tree to replace it with uh, either an indigenous or one that's a preferred tree. Is that something that we could do given how things are structured today or would we have to look at that differently? I guess that's from in terms of what we're being asked to look at. And I will give credit to Council Member Collins for this because he and I talked about this and this was his idea, but he didn't mention it, so I thought I would. I mean, we could, we could, uh, uh, Greg Rubens here, City Attorney, we, we could um, develop a program that would create an incentive um, for preferred species um, and have, and uh, as the arborist has commented, address some of the placement issues or uh, appropriate location issues as part of that. Uh, uh, I think it's, you know, I, I think we, it just would require study to, to make sure we were, we covered all the issues that might arise um, in such a program, <clears throat> but we would want to identify uh, and, and uh, the, the criteria for these preferred types of trees, whether it's a valley oak or a, or a coast live oak or, you know, a sycamore or some you know, different trees that are native trees, you know, if, that, if those are the trees that we felt were the most appropriate for uh, uh, San Carlos, then, then we would want to develop the findings that why they're part of our preferred environment. Uh, maybe they help with wildlife or, or you know, some other <clears throat> criteria that we could create it, uh, create the public purpose for, for having a program like that. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Uh, that's all the questions I had, Madam Mayor. I have some comments for later when we have discussion. All right. Thank you. Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have two questions. My first question is, um, Rucha, do you, could you give us a quick overview on the current approved reasons for removing a heritage tree? Within San Carlos? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Um, can we go to slide number 19? Yes. Um, one slide about that, 19. That there's no numbers on it. So is it this one or where? Before this. Before this, thank you. Yes, thank you. So here on the slide, I have um, listed the reasons for various uh, reasons for tree removal. And um, the third row is San Carlos, which includes um, reasons include uh, if a tree is diseased, unsafe, can cause damage, nuisance, danger for of falling, 
detracts from the value of the crop. Uh, utility interference, host for unfavorable parasites, fire hazard uh, to help utilize greater public value and um, reasonable economic use or enjoyment of the property. So these are the 11 reasons um, for tree removal within San Carlos in our ordinance at this point. And you have the phrase highlighted in red, why? Uh, I was doing a comparative analysis with uh, other cities. So San Mateo and San Carlos has it, um, both have the same. Okay. And um, as your, oh, go ahead. Oh, Andrea Marcus, it's principal planner. Just to add um, an answer to that uh, for you, council member Mattel. Uh, the reasonable economic use or enjoyment of the property um, reason is one that we get quite frequently. And in our research, that was one we really wanted to look at because it's it's pretty broad and um, you know pretty subjective too. And so we wanted to see if there's something similar in other cities um, because this is one that's you know hard to quantify what what is reasonable or not reasonable. So that that's another reason we focused on it. And Andrea, would that be part of the larger study that is put before council tonight is to take a look at, at that, um, that phrase and whether it should stay in our code or not? That, that was our thought um, and not just that phrase, but, but the, all, all of the reasons in general. Um, okay. Looking at the various cities, you can see San Carlos has 11 possible reasons, um, which is you know almost double all of the other cities or more, so. Right. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very Thank much. You. And then my second question is, um, since updating the street tree list is has been mentioned tonight, um, I, um, I recognize that in kind of the older neighborhoods of Redwood City, there are several um, beautiful tree lined streets um, and sidewalks that, you know, are a little bumpy. And in Redwood City, they allow uh, a rubber surface to kind of repair the sidewalk instead of having to cut down the tree. Has San Carlos ever looked in, I, I know this is maybe a bridge too far, but this um, and, uh, something with public works to allow for a rubberized surface to, to save street trees that might be um, protected. I Greg, don't know any, oh, sorry. I see Greg has his hand raised. Is he okay. waiting to oh. answer that or? Yeah, I, I was, I was, uh, it was from the earlier comment about the okay. phrase economic use of the property if I'm, if I'm not putting it directly it's not on the screen I think that's the, the when I see that issue as a lawyer I see a constitutional issue there so I want would want to make sure that we address that issue I'm pretty sure that's why that's there um, but there but there it is a, a broad statement so we would we wouldn't want to look at and develop objective criteria in any kind of replacement ordinance that would address that issue Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, Andrea or Stephen, I see you're on the line. Sure. Um, so in regards to kind of the rubberized <coughs> sidewalk, uh, we really haven't kind of investigated. But that is something that you know, certainly um, we probably would like to investigate that if that's a you know, possibility. I, I think some of the some of the things we would want to look at is, you know, the durability um, and then just, you know, is, um, can we make the surface ADA, ADA compliant? Um, but certainly, you know, I think we, it'd be a good um, opportunity to kind of investigate a different type of solution, so. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephen. Andrea, did you have anything to add or no? Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm finished. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a really good discussion and really good questions. I appreciate um, the, kind of the learnings from this. Um, one question I had with respect to the some of these older trees um, is, you know, there's areas of concern in the community where development is, um, and there's some, I believe, heritage trees uh, that are um, at risk of uh, being removed. What's the transplantability of uh, some of these trees? If, if they reach a certain age or maturity, is it um, not possible for them to be uh, transplanted? Because on the other side, there's also some parts of town where there's an interest in having more trees. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out um, you know, what the, what the possibilities are here for, for, you know, cre you know, for trees. I'd like to go ahead and ask, uh, the, the arborist to answer that. Um, in my experience, I only know of one instance where they've been replanted. 
Um, and that was some palm trees that were moved to the Bay Bridge and I think paid for by um, the authority over there. I'm not aware of any other instances. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding it is understanding is that it is pretty cost prohibitive, but um, Stephanie might have uh, more insight into that than me. Yes, you are correct. It, is, it can be quite expensive. Um, depending on each tree, just to be brief, it, Madam Mayor, it does depend on the, the it's a stressful situation. So it, it depends on the tree's health at the time of potential relocation, as well as uh, can you access the tree? So it does depend on a variety. So if it's like two feet away from a building, uh, is it accessible? What, what are the root, what does the root system look like of that tree? Not just the crown, not, because so there might have to be some maintenance prior, uh, some pruning prior to re, uh, relocating as well as when you get to the site. And once you relocate a tree, uh, replant, uh, replant, relocate a tree, proper care has to be taken to it. It needs, it's just like a new planting. And so plenty of water. And so it, you, it really is tree dependent. So if is the tree, um, is it, does the trunk straight? Does it have a co-dominant stem? So there, it, it each depends on the tree, the location, and in some factors which could be outlined uh, further if, if you would like. And it's okay, just like so much welcome. Yes, I understand. It's complicated. Thank you. It, 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. All right, I don't see any additional uh, hands from council. So Crystal, anybody wishing to make public comment on this? Yes, we do have two hands at the moment. I'll go ahead and allow the first one in. Uh, Josh Wallace, you should be able to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's a bit of an echo. If you can uh, actually lower or mute your video while you speak, that will probably help. All right. Uh, well, I'm filling in for Josh Wallace here. I'm his wife, Sandy. Uh, my question is, number one, I wasn't here for the SBs talking about the SB 9 and 10. And these go hand in hand. If, they're, if, this, if the state is allowed to uh, dictate where and what can be built on lands, there are going to be so many more trees taken down. And all this discussion to me seems so reactive instead of proactive and in the meantime there are so many trees being taken down and you someone said that there were maybe nine trees uh that were uh, registered you know a registered complaint about nine trees in five years and i'd venture to say there are so many more people don't know though how to uh bring this to the city where to bring it what to say whether or not what they've seen is illegal and do you ask the guys who are cutting down the trees so there's so much at play in here i just feel like we're rearranging the chairs on the titanic and i i just hope something can move forward because we're losing trees right and left and if nine and ten pass we're going to lose even more thank you sandy thank you sandy uh, next speaker we have is Sonia Elks. Sonia, you should be able to unmute now. Yes, thank you for taking my comment. I um, wanted to uh, thank you for raising this issue, for having this discussion and put in, uh, and really appreciate the previous caller's comment as well. Um, I think the protection of our trees in our town is really really important and i realize it's a difficult way to navigate that but recently the the tree on cedar that the the family um was going to remove and then they found another way to save the tree um i think that was a really great example of of um i, I was just really glad to hear that they could could save that after all and whatever we can do to have more of that kind of a story um where we can figure out creative ways to save trees. I'm all for and appreciate you having this discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Uh, and we do have one more speaker, Ken Castle. You should be able to unmute. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, let, let me be very clear. In White Oaks, 
we've had one tree episode after another. We have been concerned not only with spec developers, but with uh, newcomers that have come into the neighborhood. There's great pressure to expand housing, uh, a lot of redevelopment that's going on, re a lot of remodeling. I don't think a lot of these newcomers understand what the tree ordinance is all about. Frankly, I don't understand what it's all about when you see that it allows redwood trees uh, under 72 inches in circumference to be removed without a permit. I mean, if you start looking at other cities, and I, I would encourage you to add Palo Alto and Burlingame to the comparisons, you will find that you, you're going to see violations occur if you start injuring or taking out redwoods of 40 inches in circumference or larger. So we're way behind the scenes in this. And we have people that are looking to do this right and left, even as I speak. So it's time to get some uh, some some overhaul in what is a, a vastly uh, archaic and outdated uh, uh, ordinance. It's time to educate the public, especially newcomers and spec developers. Honestly, I've never seen a spec developer that liked a tree. I've never seen remodeling contractors that liked a tree. They're considered to be obstacles to what they really want to do. So we've got to put an end to this expediency, Councilman Dugan, an end to this and stop the tree removal. We're going to lose thousands of trees this summer from wildfires, and we certainly don't need to encourage anything that removes perfectly healthy trees in our neighborhood. We have a strong population here in White Oaks, and I think elsewhere in San Carlos that wants to see uh, these trees protected. Obviously, there can be occasions when it's justifiable to remove them, but we need to be a lot clearer on that. And I think it's time to have a moratorium on removing redwood trees that are above 40 inches in circumference because the six months you're gonna to take to review this, more trees will fall if we don't stop it now. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And uh, there are no more hands. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we'll go ahead and move to council comment. Uh, Council Member Collins. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm going to be interested to hear what the other council members have to say. I just have some some random thoughts uh, to begin with. Um, when I was looking at the city approved street tree list, it seemed to me that there really were no native trees on that list. And I, I could be wrong, but if we're going to have an approved list of street trees, it seems to me that we ought to we ought to put native trees on that on that list that are appropriate for for streets. Um, I also agree with that comment earlier about you know the, the in kind tree replacement. Um, I get the the point that you know you want somebody to replace a tree that they remove with the same kind of tree, but you know, where feasible, I think that's fine. But it, it could be that that was the wrong tree for that location in the first place, and maybe there's a better tree that ought to be replaced. Obviously, I think it ought to be replaced, but but I don't think that we should be rigid on that, on that in-kind uh, issue. Um, the other thing on that preferred list, I, I looked at it, if that, where it says San Carlos species list info, I, I'm not sure if that's our preferred tree list, but there's several trees on there that I don't know how they got on there. They've got, you know, invasive roots, uh, they drop seeds, they um, they're not drought tolerant and things like that. So I think that's one, that's another thing that we ought to look back, look at. I like the part about enhancing our, our webpage, uh, and making it more robust. Um, the, um, the issue of, uh, the incentive program, I, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. I'm also wondering whether or not, and I'd be interested to hear my fellow council members comments on this. I think Sarah, you mentioned something about uh, a lot of tree-lined streets and whether or not we should, and I'm wondering whether or not we ought to think about a program where we could incentivize people to uh, plant more street trees on their own on their own properties. Um, I think I've raised this, raised this before, but I'm thinking of something we might want to talk about. And then finally, to Mr. Castle's point, um, I'm wondering whether or not we should consider a moratorium while we are rewriting this uh, ordinance. And I'd be interested to hear our city attorney's point of view, um, a moratorium on removing trees while we refine this tree ordinance. 
So I, I may have a couple other comments, but I think I'm going to leave it at that for, for the moment. Greg, maybe you could give us some guidance here on that, on a moratorium, whether or not a war moratorium would be workable. Yeah, I, I, well, it, it could be. I, I think, as we've heard tonight, there's a lot of complexity in 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 removing of trees. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, the findings about the tree being dangerous or in danger of falling or damaging property, we would need to address that. So it might not just be a moratorium; it might be an urgency ordinance that would have an overlay of different policies that would be interim policies while we studied the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, and so that that's probably the direction I would think we would want to go um, rather than just a straight moratorium. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's what I was looking for. Um, all I, that's all I have for the moment, Madam Mayor. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Dugan, and then we'll go to Council Member Rack. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, no, I, you know, I'm definitely a, a fan of trees. Uh, we need to do what, what, whatever is necessary to protect our trees and to make sure we're all treating our trees responsibly and saving them for future generations. Um, I guess, you know, when, when we wade into new topics, I'm, I'm always more interested in, in the data and just making sure we're focusing our efforts on what we'll have you know, solve real problems that, that we're experiencing. So, you know, so I guess given that we have less than two uh, enforcement issues a year, I'm not sure we need to be raising the penalties, especially in the sense that it sounds like most of the um, actual issues are people aren't even aware of the ordinance. I, I would like to see us put greater effort into education and, and, and getting an understanding out there of, of how this ordinance works. Now, if there's other aspects that need to get updated or tweaked, or if, you know, staff wants to uh, wade in and, and, and spend time uh, updating this, you know, I'm supportive of that. I, I, I didn't hear a whole lot um, that, that needed to be fixed. Um, the uh, uh, would be supportive of a list of specific trees that, that we would approve. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Ron's comment about uh, encouraging street tree plantings, I think that'd be a great idea. I lived in a city once that actually did a city program where they literally just went down the street planting trees neighborhood by neighborhood. And, you know, I, I went back and looked uh, 25 years later, it's beautiful tree lined streets now. So, you know, I'm all for more trees whatever we can do to encourage them. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Member Rack and then Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I appreciate the comment. Uh, so Ron, to your urgency ordinance, I would say yes uh, to that. I, if that's the best approach on that, I do think we need to be mindful of that because I think as Mr. Castle pointed out, there seems to be this potential that there's a lot of uh, illegal tree cutting going on that we're not getting any kind of um, you know, we're not aware of. So I think the more we can educate the public to be sort of our eyes and ears on that, I think that's important um, as well. So that I think that's a good uh, reminder for that. Um, I, I think we should definitely be looking at a revamp of this ordinance. Um, I'm certainly in favor of looking at the, the reasons for removal that the vice mayor uh, mentioned in terms of the economic use. And, and I just would rather work with more certainty around those than sort of uh, more something that's more amorphous. So I think if we can get around that, I think that'd be great. Um, I do think um, we should enhance our penalties, um, maybe to be more in line with places like Menlo Park uh, that have, um, you know, five thousand dollars or the value of the tree, whichever is higher. I think that's more appropriate for that. Um, I would like to see a better replacement policy closer to the forty-eight inch box tree that. Um, Menlo Park has, I think, or San Mateo. Um, I, I think I would look at the if you know if there's the illegal or the removal of a indigenous tree. Either way, I I would like us to have something that says you replace it with the same tree unless the arborist and the community development director um, approve something else. So it's sort of not um, I can just pull whatever I want and it's you have to replace unless it is not the right tree and you sort of have to have that sort of active 
decision made by the arborist to do that. Um, I think that's a better way to, to approach that. Um, and I do like the idea of, you know, getting more street trees and looking if we can incent the more indigenous trees to be put in, um, you know, as a replacement, if there's some incentive to get rid of some of the eucalyptus and, and incent people to put more uh, indigenous trees um, around there. And I would like to tighten up the list that we have for replacement um, so that it's more appropriate for that. Um, and I do think, and, and I, I think about, you know, I, there are reasons that we need to remove trees. I get that. And I think we, you know, we just want to be mindful and supportive of people who are, who need to deal with trees because they have some damage to their properties that's, you know, unrepairable or the tree's not healthy and that we can look at, um, you know, it, it, helping them uh, with that and helping them pick the right tree to, to replace it with. Um, those are kind of my thoughts. I think this is a good area for us to focus on. And um, I look forward to further discussion on this. Thank you, Council Member Rack, Vice Mayor Mc. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I agree with my colleagues. I think that we should support including native trees um, and uh, removing invasive plants on both tree lists. Um, I, I do support a comprehensive protected tree ordinance, and I would appreciate um, the consideration of um, of a moratorium unless um, there's extreme safety issues. I think that that was a really good idea and I appreciated the feedback from the city attorney. I, um, I do think that the devil is kind of in the details here. And so I think that we're gonna have to look at some kind of nuanced policies. I noted that um, in San Mateo, in-kind replacement is required sometimes um, and it has to be um, approved by the managing arborist that there is an exemption for a case of medical allergy testing. Um, and I think that that's important because um, there are trees that some people are severely allergic to and the one-to-one -one, um, you know, replacement just might not work. So I, I, I would like to see a kind of nuances in our policy coming back. Um, I also think it's really important to set up the tree for success. So if it wasn't growing in the right place in the first time, I don't, I wouldn't want to repeat that failed experiment. Um, I, I support street trees, but I think we need to be really careful of sewer lines too. So that's another nuance I think that I would like to see in the policy where if a sewer line is running diagonally through the front yard, maybe it's not a good idea to put a big robust tree right on top of your sewer line. That probably won't work out well. Um, and then I would, I would love to hear my colleagues' um, comments. I think Stephen was kind of open to looking at rubberized surfaces on the sidewalk. And I think that that, I've seen several trees cut down because they are disturbing the sidewalk. And I think that Redwood City could be a good model for this. It's helped protect, protect some of their street trees in the older neighborhoods by not cutting them down, but also putting, pouring a rubberized surface over the sidewalk um, to, you know, to, to, kill two birds with one stone maybe to, to preserve the tree and also help the sidewalk. So um, those those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rack, I see you have your hand up again. All right, I forgot two, th one, two things. One, I just wanted to comment on the rubberized sidewalks. I do think that's worth looking at. And second, I just wanted to comment, uh, Madam Mayor, on I think what you were alluding to where we've got some bigger projects um, potentially coming up and which could impact a significant number of heritage trees. And I, I'm wondering if there's a way to look at those projects separately um, in terms of how we manage that and work with the developers on that um, to preserve those trees as much as possible or, um, you know, to, to kind of take a look at that separately. I think that would be the only other point I would, I would raise. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, really good discussion and, and um, I think very timely. I think it, I would agree, I think it's time to contemporize our tree policy program and bring it up to uh, 2021. <laughs> uh, there's probably a lot, you know, it's clearly lots of learnings uh, since this policy was put in place. Um, with respect to, you know, things that I, I would like to see in it, um, I, I really appreciate the idea of education around this. Um, and I know that there are, you know, uh, Palo Alto is engaged in a canopy program. I'd be curious to see what that's about. Um, you know, how could we educate the community about, um, you know, the, the importance of trees and how best to do them. Um, when it comes to um, some of the other recommendations that you had in next steps, um, I'm in alignment with some of the things that you are suggesting, Rucha, that we take a look at um, on uh, page seven of the packet. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense. 
I'm also wondering, you know, as a homeowner, where would I go to find some of these native trees? Um, I don't know where I would go. I've been to a few nurseries, um, but we do have a fabulous gardening club here in San Carlos, and perhaps we can enlist their help uh, to create seedlings uh, and make it easy for homeowners to um, get these uh, saplings and, and educate them, right, on how to take care of them, because I understand when they're infants, uh, they do need a lot of TLC. Uh, so that might be um, something to look at. Um, I was also taken by our um, our preferred tree list and uh, the fact that many of them, uh, almost all of them on there are recommended to stay three to five feet away from sidewalks and we're investing heavily in a sidewalk repair program. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know enough about native trees to know if those trees are gonna have the same issues um, uh, as uh, what, you know, we're currently seeing. So in other words, if the native tree list is also problematic for our sidewalks and our streets, I think we need to better understand that as well. I'm not saying that I'm not in favor of it, but just trying to balance these things. Um, uh, and then it would be great too, if the city could, um, you know, uh, demonstrate best practices. So for example, along Laurel Street, uh, those trees are problematic. Um, they've been diseased for quite some time. We haven't received a lot of complaints about them this year because of the Laurel Street closure. Uh, but I have noted uh, that you know aphids um, seem to be in some of the trees uh, still and the sidewalks are sticky. Um, so I think it would be great for us to have an updated contemporary list um, uh, that is, um, you know, helps us achieve multiple goals <laughs> uh, as it were. Um, and there's one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, okay, well, I think, I, think, um, I think that was pretty much it. So um, uh, Jeff and staff, do you, do you feel like you have what you need to move forward with um, the next steps on this? Uh, I feel good about the discussion that we've had, but I'll um, I'll let Al and his staff uh, chime in here and make sure that uh, they feel like all the bases have been covered. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Yes, I think we have enough information to go on this evening. And what um, the one thing that I think that we'll do, unless you advise otherwise, is um, is we'll take a comprehensive approach to the ordinance and we can bring back potential changes. Um, Al, you're breaking up, we can't hear you. Jeff, do you, can you hazard a guess what he's saying? With a comprehensive <laughs> okay. Review? Oh, I'm sorry, did I, did I cut okay. out? It froze. So it sounds like you said you're gonna take a comprehensive view and look at penalties and fees and. Along with the, yeah, along with the, entire look at the at the whole ordinance take a comprehensive approach to everything as opposed to one of the things that we thought we would do if, if you were interested and you felt like it was a priority is to bring back the fee and the penalty and the um, one to one tree planning ahead of the comprehensive review but i think that um you know from a staff perspective we'd prefer to do it all as one uh comprehensive ordinance if that's okay with you mm -hmm. So uh, um, I see Ron, uh, Council Member Collins has his hand up and then Vice Mayor McDowell um, and then Council Member Rack. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I, uh, I'm in support of what Al was just saying, that, you know, coming back to us with uh, some suggestions on fees and penalties and that sort of thing. Actually, the only thing I wanted to say was to, to thank Rucha and Andrea and Stephanie, this is really a comprehensive report and I really appreciate it. Uh, it was the most interesting reading I've seen in a staff report in a while and it got me grabbing my Western Garden book to look at all these trees that we have in this area and what zones trees can survive in. So uh, anyway, thank you again. I thought you guys did a magnificent job. Great, thank you, uh, thank you Council Member Collins. I think it was, uh... Whoever I shout it out next, it's getting late, so we'll keep me honest. I'll go quickly. I um, also wanted to thank staff. I also wanted to thank Council Member Rack for putting this on the agenda and bringing this back to Council. I think it was very timely. 
Um, I support the comprehensive review. I just wanted to ask when we might expect the uh, moratorium, um, perhaps from the city attorney. Hopefully that can come back sooner than later. Um, and I'm just wondering about the timing on that. Yeah, so I think he, he was suggesting an urgent uh, urgent yeah. ordinance as opposed to My apologies. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, urgency ordinance is a little more complicated, but I think it's more suitable, again, for this instance. Um, I'll have to talk with staff about our, our joint um, uh, time impact, but uh, in the, our next meeting is um, what are the 20, 24th or something like 24th. 24th. Yeah. Um, and so that may be possible. I probably not. Um, so maybe the first meeting in June, if, if that works with the rest of the calendar. Um, but uh, you know, it's not, I mean, we sometimes we have to act quickly on, on urgency ordinances. So it's not unheard of that we would act more quickly. It's just, it's sort of a workload issue and, a, and, and uh, the tightness of our agenda is to cover something like this because it is pretty complicated. Thank you, Councilmember Rack and Councilmember Dugan. So uh, the Vice Mayor asked my question about the timing for the urgency ordinance. So I would just will say I support the comprehensive approach and look at the urgency ordinance and I appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Councilmember Dugan. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll just say I, I support the comprehensive approach. Let's uh, look at it all together. Let's let's be thorough. Let's let's get everything done. Um, as far as a moratorium or uh, um, an emergency ordinance, I mean, I guess, I, you know, I, if I personally, I have not perceived, you know, I mean, we had a recent significant tree issue in town and it seemed like our existing uh, ordinance handled it. Um, so I, I'm not seeing the, the, the urgency of, of a moratorium here personally, if there's data or or, you know, maybe it's just not hitting my neighborhood, but I'm, I'm, I don't have a perception that, you know, we need to do anything uh, dramatic. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like we're looking at a matter of a, a couple of months to put this comprehensive review together. And, you know, I mean, I could be persuaded. I just, I'm, I'm not seeing the urgency of moratorium or, or uh, you know, emergency ordinances here. That's, that's my view on that. Right. Thank you, Councilmember Dugan. I, I, I heard uh, Vice Mayor McDowell and Councilmember Rack in favor of it, and Councilmember Collins, you proposed it. So, um, but when it morphed into the urgency ordinance, could you just clarify your position on it, please? Well, I was looking for guidance from Greg, and he gave it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think an ur urgency ordinance is fine. Okay. It gets All the right, job so done. It's not going to last long. We'll, we'll have our, you know, we'll have something to review within a couple months. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. All right. Okay. Well, that settles that. Thank you for clarifying, uh, Council Member Collins. I appreciate it. Sure. All right. So I think um, I think we're we can move on to the next uh, agenda item then, and uh, thank staff very much for your comprehensive uh, report and the discussion. Very interesting and uh, timely. All right, I'm gonna suggest um, two things uh, that we make a motion to extend the meeting and that we take a 10 minute break before we move into the next item. Or actually, you know what, let's do the next. Uh, well, we have agenda setting right now. So, um, and then we, we, and then we go the to closed session. Ethics, don't we have the ethics? Do we have one more item? Yeah, there's one more item. <laughs> and, and do we have, I, Madam Mayor, can I ask, do we need to do all the closed session items tonight or? I guess that would be one question I have when we think about extending. Uh, Jeff, could you clarify, please? Um, let's see. I would say that you need uh, to do the AFSME closed session item tonight. Uh, the city manager eval conversation can happen anytime the council would like. Uh, Greg will have to weigh in on the legal issue in terms of the timeliness. And then the um, item related to uh, all units, um, I think we'd like to do tonight, but that, that should be a, uh, a really quick one. Yeah, on, on, the, um, on the real estate negotiation item, I mean, it's, it's not so urgent that we have to do it tonight, but I've, I've been uh, 
corresponding and communicating with um, a uh, council on this issue and and um, I had informed them that we would be um, I'd be trying to get some direction tonight but if there's not enough time there's not enough time so thank you Greg uh, council member Collins um, yeah I was just going to ask whether or not uh, the next item on the agenda uh, the uh, the ethics uh, issue might be able to be uh, moved or tabled to another meeting. If not, happy to do it tonight, but I'm just curious in the interest of time. I'm not aware of there being any urgency around that particular item. There, there's not. Okay, so I, I'll suggest we table it since I skipped over it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, okay so okay so uh all right so why don't we you take still a, need a motion right to extend the meeting yeah if it would be nice just to take care of it now and then we can and then adjourn for a all right. break and then come uh, back I'll, I'll, move we, uh, I'll move we extend the meeting at 10 45. oh i think we're going to need more time than that don't we have like you think four for items? the closed session all right i would 11. say 11 30 uh, just at uh, 11 or something 11 30. why don't we just say midnight and not do it three times i i move we extend the meeting till midnight and hope it doesn't take that long i don't hear a second so uh do we want to go back to the previous suggestion uh, well let me amend my motion to 11. i think we can get done in 55 minutes I'll second the 11 o'clock motion. All right, Crystal, can you take the roll? Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Rack? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Vice Mayor McDowell? Yes. And Mayor Parma Lohan? Yes. Okay, so if we could be back here at 10-16. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Will do. Uh, Crystal, are you back? I am back and we are ready when you are. Okay, fantastic. All right, so the next item is 11, agenda setting. All right, then we'll go ahead and move into closed session and um, after closed session, Greg and I will return uh, back to the main room to uh, close and adjourn the meeting. So we'll see you in the closed session. <laughs> you know, Jeff, Jeff promised me, like, we'd be done by 10.30. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, I don't know why he said anything. Okay, we are ready for your report. Thank you. All right. Thank okay. you. And there's no report from the closed session tonight. And I, I don't know, if, um, the, just for the benefit of the public, the, the council extended the meeting till um, 1130 in the closed session. So. All right. Thank you, City Attorney Rubens. Uh, thank you, City Clerk uh, Mui, the, uh, I We are now adjourned. Okay. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Have a good night.